All right, good evening, everyone. This is a regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education meeting here on Monday, September 13th, 2021 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. As a reminder, we are guests tonight in Downers Grove Village Hall, and please ask all those attending to wear a mask. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. So anyone who is interested in making a comment tonight, please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over there to my right. As we no longer have limits on in-person attendance, we will not be taking any remote comments at this time. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment tonight, three minutes per person. All right, kicking us off tonight, we want to welcome Herrick Middle School here. We have the principal and assistant principal, Dr. David Norman and Miss Sam Inglima. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for having us. We're very excited to be here. Um, we have Kristen Noonan, who is our PTA president-elect, who is also here. And then uh, I'm Dr. David Norman, and this is Mrs. Samantha Inglima. And we're excited to do the flag salute, and we had uh, Mrs. Tartaglioni's fifth period home base um, do the Pledge of Allegiance for us. I <laughs> So in case you're, you're unaware, uh, I am a brand new principal and Mrs. Samantha Inglima is a brand new assistant principal. So we took a lot of time over the summer to really work with the staff to understand what it is a Herrick Spartan, uh, what a Herrick Spartan is. We determined that Spartans are purposeful, respectful, inclusive, driven, and engaged, which is our new Spartan Pride acronym. Posters are hung in every room with this acronym, and with the help of the PE department, Mrs. Inglima and myself went to every physical education class and gave a presentation on what it means to be purposeful, respectful, inclusive, driven, and engaged. Our, our goal as a staff is that not only are these helpful for their time at Herrick, but these are attributes that we want as they go into high school and as they go throughout the rest of their life. I'm gonna introduce Mrs. Christine Noonan. My name is Kristen Noonan. Thank you for having me. Um, I am the president-elect of the Herrick PTA, and I will just go over a couple things that we do to support and enrich the students and also the staff at Herrick. Um, we have an active and an involved PTA with a lot of great support from parents and staff. Um, as Dr. Norman said, we are a sponsor of the Herrick Pride celebrations, and we will support as the year goes on whatever they need um, that comes up with that. Um, Herrick PTA also supports the departments and the clubs by, we have bought equipment for classrooms, books for the LRC, fitness equipment for PE, just to name a couple things. Um, we also support student council, book club, drama club, and hope club, just to name a few. We support and sponsor a dance and etiquette class for our eighth graders. Um, if we're able to have that this year, we will see, hopefully. So. Um, teacher appreciation, that's a full week where we support the teachers with different meals and just fun surprises throughout the week. And that's a collaboration of parents working together to support that. We also support retirement celebrations and sometimes monthly treats for um, staff in the building. Um, another thing that we do, we support Herrick families during times of uh, crisis if needed. We are there to support all of our Herrick families. So we are an integral part of the school and we look forward to working with uh, Dr. Norman this year. So going forward, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So Orange Frog is, is very important to us and the power of positive psychology. And so in the opening days, we worked together and came up with what does Spartan Pride mean to us as a staff? And so collectively, as we went through that training, which was super, super impactful for us, we, we decided that as a staff, 
we are dedicating ourselves to putting our people first. That's our parents and our students. That we're gonna be respectful of one another and respectful of one another's opinions. That we're gonna teach our students with integrity, that we're dedicated to our profession, and most importantly for our middle school age students that we are enthusiastic every day that we walk into the building to make sure that we are creating a middle school experience that they will remember. Hello. Um, we are also, during this year, recognizing the heritage of Herrick. The building has been around since 1953. Um, that picture there is actually the first graduating class of Herrick. It is hung in the building. Um, there are definitely relatives, I'm sure, of the people who are there. We have heard numerous comments from parents um, at all of our back to school functions so far about how the building has changed relatively little since they were there, which is great to have them relive some of those middle school memories. Um, we also wanna make sure that we are building upon what it is that the people before us have done, both students and staff. Um, so we're embracing and recognizing the accomplishments of those who have come before us so that we may build upon it and continue the traditions of Herrick. So as we look at our impact and strategic goal number one, which is focusing on learning, we're utilizing the cycles of inquiry process to specifically look at vocabulary strategies that our teachers are using to teach vocabulary. This is really the focus of our school improvement. We felt that it was important to understand how we're currently teaching vocabulary to review that specific data and choose an implementation strategy that we will measure and collect data on its effectiveness over the course of the school year. We really focused on a ground up approach to understanding what vocabulary strategies are currently being taught within the classroom. And we saw feedback from all of our staff to understand what's already happening in the classroom, what evidence-based strategies are being used, so we can build upon that to create a robust SIP plan. We're also teaching a new social studies curriculum and utilizing technology in the classroom. Our teachers have been using Google Classroom extensively and we are currently transitioning to the utilization of Google Meet for all virtual learning connections and for parent meetings. While we do not anticipate that we will go remote, we do want to be prepared in the event that we do have an emergency e-learning day at some point in the future. And strategic goal number two is really connecting with the community. And as you see, we started a Twitter account specifically for Herrick this year, and that is a picture of Herrick in 1953. Um, in addition, we're sending weekly newsletters, announcements via S'more, staff and family student communication, and we really want to seek, connect, and establish ourselves within the community to make sure that everyone understands what is happening at Herrick. We're also currently exploring the possible utilization of live streaming our athletic events. So if people are uncomfortable coming into the building because of the number of people, that they can still access and watch their children or watch their grandchildren um, perform at, in athletics. Thank you so much for your time today, and it was an honor to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to the district. All right, next up on our agenda is a public hearing on the proposed 2021-22 legal budget. Uh, so first I want to start off with Todd Drayfall. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> this is the... Uh, annually required budget hearing uh, for fiscal year 2022-2021-22 uh, uh, budget. Uh, the budget's been on display uh, for the last 30 days. It was introduced a month ago. We've had some adjustments and changes. That is not uh, uncommon. In fact, uh, I think I noted back in August that there may be additional changes to this budget more than in, in previous years as we continually work through um, an ever-evolving um, process that we have uh, dealing with the pandemic and uh, the challenges uh, that that, um, that brings to us. Um, the biggest shift in this budget compared to what we would call normal budgets back in 2019, 2018, so forth, is a significant increase in federal funds for the district. Uh, those come from, in large part, from two places. The ESSER funds uh, that the federal government has provided to school districts across the country to assist it in managing um, COVID and pandemic issues. Uh, ours are for and, and helping to cover for uh, interventionists. Uh, we have funds um, allocated for uh, lunchroom supervision. Uh, that was a huge increase, uh, as the board may recall, 
last spring when we came back from our hybrid structure to a full-time format and had uh, lunch in classrooms and had to accommodate that piece. Uh, there's one other piece, and I, I was to do is running some quick numbers uh, that we had talked about at the FAC a little bit, and that is uh, uh, the federal lunch program. Downers Grove 58 uh, had a, a hot lunch program at uh, the two middle schools and a program at a puffer school uh, previous to the pandemic. Uh, that hit, we switched into a format where the federal government provided uh, funding for uh, meals for any uh, child who so wished. We worked with our, th our uh, high school and our partner district in Woodridge to form up a coalition to ensure through the shutdown and through that summer that any child in the communities that we serve uh, had a meal and we drove those out. Um, there was a facility, you know, uh, open up uh, facilities dropped at apartment buildings uh, in Woodridge and so forth to accommodate that. We went into the, the next year in a similar format. That has shifted again to a different format, a little more formal under um, still seamless summer, but more of a, a structure where we have to account for meals and so forth. That has an impact where we are current, and that means that any student who wishes to receive a meal may, may, may receive one. We are, as of last week, serving about 1,400 either lunch or breakfast snacks a day uh, throughout the district. Uh, that is funded by the federal government. We have an account sheet for those at each school as, as they're tracking those. Um, board may be aware that you know, we've had some, there are some uh, supply chain shortages that we've been managing and dealing with, but that puts us at a considerable increase in that program somewhere in a half million to six hundred thousand dollars or more in federal in both expenditure and in revenue um, for that program that too has an impact and an increase in this budget and so you may be asking why we're going through the federal pieces um, if you look through the revenue you see about a hundred and thirty two percent increase in federal funding in the education fund uh, that we are anticipating and, and project uh, almost $5.8 million in federal funds compared to 2.5 the, the prior year. And I would, didn't run this, go back and look, but I would guess that in years past, we'd be lucky if we hit maybe a million one, a million two. It is a significant increase um, over that time. One of those pieces that impacts, and one of the issues with that is Federal funds come from reimbursement. You only receive them once you've spent them, and you have to spend them first. And so um, now they come back in within a quarter or so. Once you've submitted uh, that quarter ends, you submit the reports, and, and, and those funds are then sent in. That has an impact because the board approved last spring a fund balance policy that we had worked through for the last couple of years of a 35% ending fund balance to expenditure. Uh, that was to, and that was calculated so that at our low cash point in the spring, prior to the early property taxes arriving, we would have funds on hand to cover the operational expenses. In years past, it was not uncommon to be looking at a $2 million payroll and have a million dollars in the bank. Um, fortunately, property taxes came in on that Monday uh, we charge our payroll accounts on Wednesday, and you know checks are out on or the deposits made are made on Friday. Um, that's how close we were at times on our cash flow. Thus, the reason for the 35% rule. Given the federal increase in expenditures and offset for revenue, uh, that puts us at a challenge to and an impact because that sharply increases that expenditure. Federal funds are, as of course, reimbursed for the year um, and are in addition to any state and local. Once we come up with a total, and you see in down, I don't, down, <laughs> we didn't work this out ahead of time. Um, there you go, $441,000. Um, that is where we are 
just under that threshold of, uh, of that 35%. We feel comfortable in recommending this budget being under that threshold, but please understand it's the first year we've had that piece and the reason we've been pushing forward is, is circumstances we've just talked about. Um, this one time because of this shift uh, with those federal funds, which is driving a large piece of that, of that difference. We also would not, given the framework of the expense and revenue that impact from the federal side, would not add, would not recommend reducing programs uh, to compensate for that expenditure. Because the only way to bring that down, remember federal funds are on top of state and local, would be to reduce programs uh, to meet to that, that criteria, a combination of fund balance increase to, uh, to expenditures. Um, that is, you know, and that number is, of course, is with the expenditures to the fund balance prior to measurement of, of, the pro of any proceeds that would be from, from the Longfellow sale. Uh, that Longfellow sale is in there. Uh, that's where you get to that 35 plus range. Uh, but looking at this from that operational standpoint, from not taking into account those one-off year, um, and those aren't revenues, they're uh, sale of, pros of, of assets um, and impact. So uh, we wanted to bring that to the board's attention given the new policy piece um, and the reasons why we would recommend this budget considering that as a budget and with those proceeds it obviously it meets that 35 percent threshold without those uh it is slightly under that and the reasons why are as we've as we've noted um, overall it's obviously it's in a sense a balanced budget you can see that there is a sharp increase in the ed fund fund balance uh, we have projected adjusting the property tax levies you will start to see that at the October meeting for the tax levy um, to reduce in the operation and maintenance some transportation uh, and the IMRF Social Security funds um, the levy for amounts for those to help increase the education fund going forward uh, given its fund balance overall um, other than that uh, if there are any questions on the budget I should add, uh, for those in the audience, this is the last part of a process that effectively started December 7th, uh, 2020, with an initial presentation of a five-year projection piece that um, ended up with the board approving a five-year financial plan in April. Uh, this budget is then based on that plan with execution for funding the, the technology schedule that is in that plan as well as the curriculum and the programming levels that was developed in that plan um, so between December and April a lot of the work is done uh, in creating this piece this is essentially the final aspect of this uh, that has been going through and worked on since last December I guess, Todd, the only question I have is if we look at it from a process perspective, right, we've kind of implemented this, this five-year time horizon, which is, which I think is a big win for the district, right? We're looking longer term, but so we got three months before the next budget cycle starts. I guess what did we learn over the last year that you're going to kind of look to make any tweaks to the overall process? I think we actually are, are going to look at pushing out and starting not in December, but a little bit later into the January uh, time frame uh, just because of the there's some unknowns uh, at that point and having you know some some certainty pieces uh, on a process point I think we we now have done it one year um, even given all of the added um, uh, items to put into it and to, to deal with and manage uh, I think we'll come out uh, the next year in a much cleaner structure uh, that we have a better understanding of kind of that process and how to manage it um, and to continually look at that schedule um, and have a finer way of, of managing the the long-term you know, needs and that is one of the pieces of the five-year 
what is our curriculum update schedule? What is that estimate? What is that cost going to look like on a year-to-year -year basis? The technology replacement schedules are in there. You know, some of those and the fund balance piece, now that that fund balance policy is approved, those being some of our rock foundations with our programming structure to come up and determine how to make sure we can fund that turnaround as well as, you know, and then eventually working on capital, um, you know, and, and those type of pieces to put into that as to replacement pieces. So I think, um, you know, once you've gone through it once, now you can start to, to fine tune and, and working and hopefully a little more um, attuneness earlier in the, in the framework so that we get it back to you in a better format sooner. Does that make sense? I mean, did yeah, I answer I your question? Maybe any, any commentary on, you know, so we kind of were saved with these federal funds, so it's kind of, you know, there, helps us but hurts us. I was uh, sure, meeting sure. with uh, a bunch of uh, colleagues uh, this last week, and we were talking about professional development for the profession uh, the next year, and I, I said one seminar we need to have is uh, federal funding hangover um, because there it has been a, a significant increase uh, and that will come is we project coming to an end um, and so we may have we have some residual still in ESSER 3 that would you know we'd be looking at uh, for interventionists into fiscal year 23 also potential you know learning loss issues and programs if, if for summer of, of 22 uh, but then it, it certainly is not the level that we have currently and, and how we manage and shift from that framework and bring back down to what it is without the $2 million. I don't know about the, the, the lunch piece. Um, I, I don't know if that's going to go away anytime soon. Um, usually some of those things tend to stay on for a little while. I think it'll be dependent on the administration as to how, what, what their, their process is and how they handle it. But uh, certainly the ESSER three funds will, will dissipate to a much smaller amount and we'll have to make those adjustments. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Todd, can you talk very briefly about just um, investment revenue and how we're faring as a district? I mean, I, I can see the numbers, um, but I don't, because I don't know what that would look like in an ordinary year. Um, so I'm, I guess, how much of a hit are we taking because of the current um, um, crisis, uh, climate? We consider the fact that our interest income from fiscal year 2018 and 2019 was $300,000, and I think our total anticipated, I don't know if I delineated out in this, is... Uh, About 50. Yeah. No, 50,000 uh, in interest income. Um, and we were at over 300 and um, I think that you know obviously those pieces you know if, if they we, we don't project those to come back mm -hmm. until the next to right. quarter of 20 sometime in 22 23 maybe where interest start to gain uh, corporate personal property replacement tax has can, has gone up considerably in this time frame um, which was not what we anticipated um, and that has been, you know, extraordinarily helpful to help offset some of that loss. Uh, property taxes are strong still. Um, we are, we will, we do have a, the, you know, the, the downtown TIF is coming off in this next year, and so that will be that process, and and, and that will give us a sharp increase um, in revenue coming. And you'll start to see some of that projection and conversation at the October meeting with, with the initial presentation and discussion of the tax levy. Um, and then uh, CPI uh, down the road into 20 fiscal year 24. Uh, you know, right now the next CPI is a 1.4 percent because that's the prior year. Uh, I think it's hovering somewhere around about 4.3, 4.5 uh, right now. And so that um, coming into hitting fiscal year 24 would have a, a, a sharp increase in revenue. Uh, so when but you're looking at um, make up, you know, about a quarter of a million dollar hit in investment revenue. Are, are we using, is, is, are we still using SR3 money? Is, I mean, I guess, where, where are we plugging, how are we plugging that hole? Is it really SR3 that's, help, that's bailing us out in this fiscal year as well? 
because federal funds uh, cannot sup can can <laughs> cannot <laughs> supplant. Uh, can they can only supplement? We you know we we have been fortunate enough to be able to absorb um, some of those decreases in that in income tax. Some of it by corporate personal property uh, increase. Uh, there has been some state aid increase. Um, also, we have had, um, and we knew this going out with, with uh, the negotiations of the contract with the teacher several years ago, um, you know, some retirement and staff uh, that have helped in, in that piece as well. I'd also add, um, and, and the board will see this in the October recommendation for health and wellness for insurance rates, last January 2021, the insurance rates were at a zero um, for three of the plans for the majority and then a 5% decrease for the high deductible with the HSA. Um, you know, that's a seven, $8 million spend yeah. uh, for the district. That is the second largest thing besides salaries that we spend money on. Um, having that had a significant adjustment allowance to help balance some of the lo those losses in revenue uh, that we had on the on the local side. Okay. Thanks, There's uh, we put in place the fund balance policy. I, I would say, speaking from my perspective, primarily as a tool for us as a board to know that we were being fiscally responsible with our annual budgets. Um, and I appreciate how much we reference that policy when we think about how close to above or you know, below we are in our recommendation on a budget for, for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, so I think it's serving its purpose. And we are about to approve a budget that is below our policy. Um, and so what that, what that makes me think is as a board is, it's, uh, sorry, it's, uh, doesn't meet our policy and we can explain why and it makes a lot of sense as to why, right? The expenditures are being offset by one to one on revenue and so there is a trade-off that we're making there and so i wonder is the policy serving its purpose because it's a helpful check and balance for us or is the policy not serving its purpose as intended where there are some cases where we can explain away why we don't meet the policy and are okay with it and in that case i'd love a recommendation on should we revise the policy or consider revising the policy where we don't have to explain it away or whenever it doesn't meet the bar, we feel like we should be making adjustments as a district in terms of expenses or revenue in order to meet the policy. Can, um, I, can I chime in here real quick too, uh, kind of from an FAC perspective? Yeah, when we, we proposed this, it really was meant to be a, a hard and fixed number and not one that we can deviate from. Um, I think what is un unique about this, and maybe this is something that we may just want to, at a future board meeting, if we don't think that this additional revenue is going to come in and we think we will stay below it, we may want to vote to officially approve an exemption for this year. The reason being is I think that the, the message that we were trying to send is that 35 is sort of a, a fixed number for us to see a trajectory going forward to be stable. What is unique about this year in the way that ESSER funds come in and we spend it and it gets reimbursed, that increased our, and we compare that to our spend, that increased spending that some of that spending may continue beyond this year, and then that's what we're gonna have to look at, and it's one of the questions I have for Todd as, as we look forward, that we have to be careful, because um, we talk about things like the TIF rolling off or, you know, or, or other aspects, that we've gotta be careful that we're not double or triple spending that money. Um, but ultimately, at the end, our goal should be to hit that 35%. This is a unique year because since we compare it to our spending, and our spending automatically increased because of the way ESSER funds came in, um, that there, there is something unique to this year. Now, one of the things we talked about in FAC is that there is still a shot that we are gonna be above that 35% if we get the revenues um, from Longfellow or with some of the spending things that we're unsure of and estimating. So I, to me, one of the things I would propose is that we take action as a board um, not necessarily at the moment that we approve this, but if it looks like it's not due to put an exemption into place for us not hitting that on a one-term basis, and then hold hold 
steady with that 35% recommendation going forward as that was sort of the recommendation that came out of FAC to look at the long-term stability. This just happens to be a unique year and I don't think we, we can't count on federal funds in the future, nor should we. And um, so beyond this sort of unique form of both revenue and expenditure that's happening while we're under the umbrella of VASR funds, uh, I, I think that we, we might have the ability to be a little loosened on that because the spirit of what we're trying to do stayed the same. If you took that out, we sort of hit that 35% threshold. Um, and so just to kind of give you an FAC perspective on that, would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and I, I guess I would kind of add some additional commentary there. Is I, I think we got almost got to the point um, where we were going to be talking about reducing programming, right? And then we got the federal front. So I think if we look back at what we've done over the last two and a half years is put in this, this five-year horizon where we're able to have those conversations right away, whereas in the past we were kind of like trying to plug a hole on an annual basis and then we'll, like, we'll figure it out next year, right? So I think now, um, come January, we're going to have, I, I actually think we're going to be talking about what we're going to have to reduce. So, so I think at this point in time, the policy is serving its purpose to kind of signal, hey, if we didn't have these federal funds, we would be cutting things, and that's probably where we're going to be in January. Technically, you are the budget because we have because the board has approved the resolution for the sale, and we have anticipated and and listed those anticipated proceeds. Your budget is within the policy guidelines uh, that the board has is living under. Um, we call it out and point out because we want to show without those proceeds what the number would be from yeah. an operational standpoint. Um, certainly as those proceeds you know, all comes to pass and um, get, you know, our portion of them or a good portion transferred to capital fund for capital uses, um, that will also have an adjustment and impact for fiscal year 23 that we'll have to address. I mean, there's, there's a variety of things happening, a lot of one time increase in expenditures, decrease in, and increase in revenues, and so on and so forth, this year, last year, next year, um, that with the new policy in place, um, you know, it's, it's there as a tool that we're, we're hoping to maintain and not have, you know, and, and to keep that low cash balance to a point of being able to meet needs. Um, and I think it'll, it'll be something we'll watch and continually work on through our planning, you know, and, and having that five-year planning piece uh, helps with that because we can look not into just 23 but 24 what those next program adjustments would need to be. Um, you know, the goal is with a five-year plan is not to start something in a new fiscal year that you can't uh, maintain a, a year or two out. Um, you know, and so having that as part of that structure um, will help us, you know, work through that, that process and, and and kind of as a check and balance throughout each each process each year right and and the conversation we had in FAC was that we really see this as meeting that threshold but if for some reason um, you know we're, part of that is is Longfellow revenue being figured into it and stuff that's why we're saying it's it's not quite there with that so for some reason we bump up into it um, it would be my recommendation coming out of FAC to have a conversation there and potentially come to the board and say, oh, well, we're not going to hit it. Let's put an exemption into place. Because what I don't want to have happen is this just becomes a guidance that we yeah. eventually ignore. Um, this really goes beyond guidance. This really is a policy that we put in place to have that threshold. Um, I think we're meeting uh, the, the letter of it as of right now. And if for some reason we don't, I think that you'll, you'll see something come back from FAC on that. That's helpful. Um, Thanks. And Steve, you had a, asked a question earlier that I just want to jump in because I think it's worth sharing. When you had asked, you know, what have we learned from this five-year plan? Um, I think the five-year plan is, is one piece of a, a very important puzzle. I remember when I was first hired, I attended a meeting and, and we were this close to tax anticipation warrants. And I remember thinking as a new superintendent, and it may have been actually one of your first meetings at, at the Pierce Downer Gym, I think we were, and it was a budget hearing. And I thought, we, we've got to start getting our ourselves out of that and, and kudos to previous boards as well because they recognize that too and I think the first step the board started taking was to get it 
balanced and get into the black. But what we found when we were just into the black, we didn't have enough money to put toward much needed capital expenses. We were just doing the absolute bare minimum. Quite frankly, we're, we're still there. We're getting a little better year by year. I think what, what we slowly started to do is to march away from that conversation of tax anticipation warrants. And the five-year plan and the 35% fund balance policy does so many things that I think it, it really does help serve as our, our North Star because if you can get that, and, and I agree with Todd, with, with the sale of Longfellow, you're, you're there and then some on, on this particular budget, it allows you now to start diverting much needed money to capital versus simply having that sinking fund that you couldn't access because you had to have enough money in your bank account to meet uh, the, the payroll. So I would continue to urge that. The other thing that we know from just the bond issuance that we did a year ago was it's important to have cash on hand because that affects your credit score and that affects your ranking. And so if we do move forward with a potential referendum, that 35% fund balance is gonna be very important to hopefully achieve the highest credit ranking so that when you borrow money, and if you borrow on a grand scale in terms of a referendum, that will certainly save the district money in the long run. So I do think we're marching more and more toward that path of long-term fiscal sustainability. Um, but the pandemic certainly strained that. Um, fortunately, we did have ESSER money because if we didn't have the ESSER money, we'd be having a much different conversation, right? And we do have a TIF rolling up, but how we manage those things in conjunction with one another and a strong fund balance policy will really help us set the bar for the future. So I think we're on a really good course moving forward and we need to stick with it. I guess I just wanted to make one last comment and that was, um, first of all, this five-year plan of process. I mean, it was, it was several years in the making as well as the 35% fund balance component and it couldn't have come at a better time because uh, obviously we, we had quite a strange last year and a half that incurred a lot of expenses for us. I think that, um, the six of us that were on the board at the time when the last budget passed um, were very concerned about what our stability was going to look like uh, you know, after the school year and what it would look like going into this school year. And, and federal funds did come and change it. But I, I think it's really important as we look forward on that five-year plan to remember that this looks like a very stable and strong budget, but there are a lot of federal money in here that we don't see, and, and as time goes on, if, if interest rates stay really low, um, if, if, if CPI crashes down at some point, which could absolutely happen, not necessarily right now here in the short term, but it could actually happen in, in a year or two out, that we are balancing out and looking to the future to make sure that we have a really uh, stable future so that we're not scrambling at the last minute to cut a program or do something that, we, that we're really being careful about it. And, um, <coughs> recognizing the fact that we got bailed out a little bit in this year because we had, we had a tremendous amount of unexpected expense uh, you know happen to us at this time so it's it, it's really important I'm glad that the CPP or T stayed strong um, you know I, I know that's not what we were expecting but the interest rates I don't think are going up anytime soon um, so I would just say we've got to be careful that we're not overspending our, our TIF money as we move forward and you know, I, I feel like every time we talk about something, and it's like, well, good news, the TIF is falling off. But I, I, I feel like we've talked about that with eight or nine things. So I just want to make sure that we're really being careful as, as we move forward. But uh, I know that, that these last couple of years, when, when trying to balance a budget, has been incredibly difficult and has changed quite a bit as we move forward. So uh, you know, thank you for that work um, that's being done. And obviously, we'll keep an eye on this as well. Mm -hmm. forward. Anything else? Perfect. All right. At this time, I declare a hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment specifically on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please stand, come to the podium, state your name, attendance area, or organization if there is one, for the record, and then please make your comment. Hi, uh, Francisco Medrano, um, El Sierra School. I noticed that the dual language program. Uh, uh, we'll budget. have time later on in the. Oh, um, it's about the budget. Okay. Yeah, I specifically about budget. Okay. Yeah, the line item on the dual language salaries. Okay. Increased from three hundred and four thousand to six hundred ninety-nine thousand. I was just wondering why. Um, 
Can you provide a little clarity on that? <clears throat> oh, you do have a mic, good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I don't know. The, um, when we put the display budget together, uh, we have information that is up to date to that point. Um, there are a, a number of changes in hires and structures that happen in that beginning piece. Um, and, and oftentimes, um, we've got lane changes for teachers. We have um, in, in sometimes positions that haven't um, been hired or otherwise, or there's been shifts. Um, and sometimes, um, I'll be free to admit, I may actually put, because I don't have it by account when I get it, I, I, I type in all of the uh, 3,000 accounts into in a format. I shouldn't say they're all 3,000, but the fair, you know, all of the salaries may put some salaries in a line that is not uh, correct. Uh, it may be in a general instruction in that uh, August budget. And then I have time uh, to come back and clean up some of those pieces and put them in, you know, uh, and adjust for the September final budget. And again, I will tell you that those numbers are several weeks old. We know there's been lane changes in structures uh, to, you know, to salaries since then, um, and some of those will, will be adjusted accordingly. So um, it, the August budget is as best as we can do at the time, and, and, and we make adjustments accordingly. And um, you know, and, and, and then make some of those adjustments and and put those in uh, when we have the you know the data. So in other words, I may have simply put some wrong salaries <coughs> into a general instruction number compared to where they ended up for the current one. So are you saying that the current number at, at what was that it six hundred? Yeah, EL and, and bilingual and and. And so okay. forth, they're in there. I mean, it's so there was stuff that was initially not categorized correctly as yeah. under the dual language umbrella, and now it got got moved in there. And we clean up, and, and the board, you know, is aware we, we did last year because we had significant adjustments to expenditures. We did an amended budget at the year end uh, to make some of those, you know, some of those are bigger, larger pieces, not necessarily s individual salary lines for different functions, um, but. You know, budget is a, a spending plan that we hope and envision and think where we're at and, and what we have. Um, you know, we, um, we know there are always some changes that happen along the way um, and adjustments. And, you know, sometimes when they start to hit larger numbers, we may re readjust those at, at the year end with an amended budget to, to cor correct it as well. But that's where we think we're at right now. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, there being no further comments, I now declare that this hearing is closed at 7.43 p.m. All right, we have some non-action reports tonight. We have listed on tonight's agenda 62 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? We'll move on to our first spotlight, which is the enrollment and staffing update. Dr. Jane Uzentis, well. Good evening. Good evening. We wanted to spend a little bit of time tonight updating our board on where we are with staffing if now that the year is underway. Um, this first slide really is that reminder of our priorities that we discussed last May. And in looking at those class size targets, we're trying to achieve 24 students, 24 or fewer in grades K through two, and then 26 or fewer in grades three through eight. It is important to keep in mind they are targets, not caps. So when we initially established those years ago through the Resources Review Council, we really were, let's try to work towards this, toward this where we know uh, we want to get there, but we won't in every case be able to maintain class sizes at that size for a number of reasons which we'll talk about. I'm sorry Jane, I don't mean to interrupt you so quickly, but you said they're targets, they're not, I, I didn't They're not caps. Not caps, okay. All we right. won't go above that. You're going to see obviously in this presentation that we are above that 
and, and then just kind of talk about those reasons why. All right, thank you. So, and sometimes I feel like there, there could be misunderstanding um, with staff, with community, with any of us that with a cap versus a target. The other priority is related to O'Keep, our optional kindergarten enrichment enhancement program. We did meet the goal, which we wanted to be able to offer O'Keep this year at every one of our schools um, and have done so. And then the third bullet related to our middle school schedule, we want to continue to work toward maintaining class sizes, 80% of our classes, meeting the target. Um, and really the bigger task that we've been working on is balancing across the two middle schools with our two middle schools in our neighborhood school model um, being very different sizes. So the chart here is focusing on our elementary schools. You'll see the total students, grades K-6, and then we wanted to share our average, what that looks like, and the range. It is important to note that these numbers, the enrollment here does not include preschool program or our special programs. Um, and you'll have, there'll be additional information later in the presentation that has that breakdown. Um, the range, we, we're very pleased with our average class size really across our buildings is a much narrower range in our, ra our ranges across our buildings. We're also very proud of what we've been able to accomplish. The chart below shows the, the breakdown of O'Keep, and it's pretty comparable to years prior to the pandemic. We typically had roughly 70% up to 80% of our families choosing the optional kindergarten program. Um, and then we have, for, for this year anyway, the 72% and then 28% of our families choosing AM only. When we look at, this is the overview of other district programs, the chart on the left speaks to the, um, the special education, the self-contained special ed programs in the various buildings. We don't include those numbers. Um, the number of students, as you will see, three classes, or you may have a class of seven, that really would skew our averages. If we put the teachers, the number of teachers in as well as, as the kids, because the, the programs here are specialized programs, are typically lower class sizes for obvious reasons for the needs of the kids. And then the chart on the right shares more information about other programs, such as dual language, where we have, you know, you'll see at El Sierra, 29 students, that's two, two teachers dedicated to dual language. Um, Kingsley, one teacher, 15 students, and then O'Neill is, we have four students for, that attend four periods of the day. And then finally, our breakdown for preschool, which really the seven classes, those are sessions. Our preschool is an AM and a PM session, so we have, um, that's the number of classes in our children that's pretty comparable to prior years. It's also important to note, and as we look at um, an upcoming chart, really that the students in these programs do participate in our, our general classrooms, specifically our special ed students as appropriate. They are included when it makes sense, when, when times where they will be successful and they do participate with their grade level peers dual language, they also do spend a portion of the day, the kids in that program, in with their um, grade level peers. Um, and then the preschool, obviously that's a separate program. This chart, there's a quite a bit of information here and quite a bit that goes into this. So this breakdown really is showing you each of the classes, K-6, Again, the numbers here don't include our, self, our special education programs, the specialized programs, or our dual language students. And you'll see on the far right side, those targets and, and kind of how, what we've accomplished in relation to the targets. We are typically, each grade level band is typically roughly around 500 students. And so our enrollment is pretty comparable to prior years. You will notice in kindergarten, the in the AM session, because that session would include O'Keefe and children who are only, um, families who are only opting for the half day, would be in, so 64% of our classes are meeting that, that target of 24 or fewer. Um, similar, or one thing to note with Bel Air, for example, that 25, there's one kindergarten teacher, 
Whereas when you're looking at El Sierra and Puffer, there would be two teachers in the AM, but there's only, there's, there are one and a half FTE. So there's an, a, one full-time teacher at those two buildings and then a half day an AM teacher. And so this is really showing what that morning would look like, then the half day students go home. And in our afternoon, 75% of our classes are meeting that class size target. Lester is, it's not uncommon. We see, we have some space challenges at Lester and those numbers did grow here towards the middle of August to be at that 28 and so that is where for sure we're over the target pretty consistently. So we kind of look, we are very proud of the other grade levels. We were able to meet our target of 80%. Another, an, an important um, point to keep in mind in, as we talked about the students that go into the classrooms during a portion of their day. So for example, I will use El Sierra and El Sierra's first grade classes. There are 20 and 22 students. The dual language students for part of their day will go in and participate in those first grade classes. So they, we would be adding six more students to one classroom, five more students to another. Um, similarly, as we think about special programs, we use the same similar model where if we look at Indian Trail. Indian Trail has the RISE program. There are five students in first grade in the RISE program. And so during their day, five students would go into those first grade classrooms and participate with the other students. Now, and really, the, the structure of what it looks like is um, a building decision. It is very important that we make sure the kids do have an appropriate level of support and are very successful. And, and so in many cases, I will use RISE as an example, there would be an instructional assistant that would go into the classroom with the students who are participating, who are included. Um, in, in other cases, I will use, for example, sixth grade Kingsley. Sixth grade Kingsley, there's 25 students. The dual language students would go into that classroom and that really has been a conversation at the building that there, there is IA support available. They may or may not have an, an instructional assistant join the classroom and that's, uh, for example, it, it's really looking at what are the curricular goals? What are the lessons? What are the activities? Is there a need? We don't need to just add another person, if you will, to a classroom unless there's a, a gain and a benefit for the students. And so um, in that example, it's, it's really maybe looking at, okay, we're in the upcoming week, we are, there's a science lesson, there's more hands-on, we, we have, we need more adults to help support and facilitate that lesson, and the building would be able to then um, flexibly schedule the staff they have. We have instructional support assistants in each of our schools that then could be prioritized to support that classroom. Similarly, El Sierra, the sixth grade, with the 29 students, there's not an instructional assistant assigned full time in that room. That's really the building principal working with the teachers, making that decision of what current staff members do I have, it, what flexibility, who is already supporting the room, and then identifying those times where there may or may not need to be an additional person for support. Um, ultimately, though, we do ensure that there is appropriate support for all of our kids in the given scenarios. But it's, there's a lot of, um, a lot goes into that decision making at the building level. So Jane, what, when would we consider, when we look at like the, the RISE or the dual language programs where we're adding additional students beyond these numbers? And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I'll use my personal experience, first grade, right, at, okay. at LCR. So, you know, that's top of mind. So I guess, when would we look at that 20 plus 5 or plus 6 or that 22 plus 5 plus 6? When, when would we say that, you know, that's kind of, you know, we, we would highlight that as blue. I guess, right. you know, obviously this is a high level presentation, you know, the building level conversations yeah. are taking place, but how do we kind of look at that at, at kind of a dashboard level where at, at this point in time I don't have great confidence just looking at this number in this presentation. So I guess how would you speak to someone in my, in my seat that I should feel comfortable with those numbers. No, thank you for asking that question. Um, in that specific example, the LCR example, there is an instructional assistant 
um, who supports the dual language program. And then, again, it's with the teams working with staff as to which part of the day that person may join first grade, that person may join second grade, you know, depending on, on the need and the size, and again, looking at the instructional um, activities, the curriculum goals. And so that model, the primary for dual language specifically, there has been instructional assistant support as the students have then moved through the program, that's really where it's been becoming a building level decision. So sixth grade looks different in how we're teaching and that's where the teachers are feeling. It, again, it's that conversation of we have, we are structuring our support in a way that we don't need again that extra, extra person or we don't need a full-time extra person and therefore that's where the buildings prioritize. Okay, I know I can, I can flexibly schedule any number of assistants um, to go into that classroom. So it's really, it is a building decision. I don't know, Steve, that I've given you a, a good answer. I would say typically in primary, we are gonna find, yes, our buildings are scheduling the assistants to, to go in and support. I, for dual language pri primary, definitely. Um, and then the special programs is different, like the RISE and the DLP and BEST programs, those are different because there are instructional assistants who support that program that absolutely can go in with students as needed. Um, and then we hope to have times where the kids are successful and can be independent, don't necessarily have to have that person. And so that some of, when it's related to the special education programs, that's gonna be more student need driven and student specific driven. Yeah. No, and, and I, I appreciate the answer, and you know I'm thrilled that you know my daughter gets to participate in that that situation. But I'm just trying to think how we, you know, for future years, how could we um, better manage expectations of, of parents in in those scenarios where, like, you know, some parents just say, "Hey, there's 28 kids in my son or daughter's classroom," but you know that may be two hours out of the day. That may be one day out of you know. I, I guess right. I'm just trying to think. You know, obviously teachers come back on Monday and classes start right away, and we have a very limited window of time to kind of articulate what's gonna what that experience is gonna look like um, for those those buildings that do have the special program. So I'm just trying to think um, what sort of proactive communication can we do for those families in, in future years. And and you bring up a very good point. I think that is one piece of feedback that we have received this year. We were coming off of the pandemic, um, really gearing up towards let's try to get, you know, we're, we have kids back in person, let's get back to a more typical year. Um, and our communication specific to our class sizes, which was something that we did put in our resources review council, like that was one of our, our goals is to put that stuff in place. I'm feeling like um, probably was not as strong as it could have been. In, in some of these pieces because we were really focusing on let's get things ready to have kids in. And, and so um, maybe with a short turnaround time, but I think, I mean, I think you're bringing up a very good point that well, it, it, there's, it, it, there's, there's less thinking. communication around our class sizes and what the structure looks like for sure. You know, not, not trying to provide solutions, but I'm thinking maybe, you know, maybe there is no good communication, right? Like you just kind of, <laughs> you get that the, the day of, and you know, it's kind of like air conditioning. Everyone's freaking out that it's 99 <laughs> degrees and the next week everyone's wearing jackets, right? You kind of short-lived memories. But um, I, I guess the way my head works is I would kind of say that's 22 plus six, so it's 28 and it's kind of, it's out of our range, but the, the corrective action that we took place is we do have that instructional assistant and we do have those dual language, um, teachers available to support that, that environment. So I almost look at it as um, we should put 28 up there if, if there's gonna be that many in the building for at least 50% of the day. Okay, and on the, right, and for the purpose of this presentation, I didn't do that breakdown, yeah. uh, right, our internal documents, that's exactly what we have by building, and then we have, so that we can take a look at where our extra, where our students going in, is there the support, um, but it's not something that I've typically included up on this chart. Just sharing perspective. But certainly could. I mean, I certainly could. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question on the instructional assistance piece. It's a building level decision sure. where, and then dependent <laughs> upon what program is in, what grade levels, et cetera. Is there anything in place, and I know we've talked about it a little bit before, anything in place that kind of provides a guidance or a standard or a expectation so that the schools that have either the similar programs or same programs are consistently applying 
qualifications for where an IA goes. Um, is there anything like that in place, or is it just kind of a floating de determination, very dependent on the individual circumstances? If, the, if you're talking specific to students with IEPs in the self-contained programs, um, that I would say is definitely, it is consistent that there is availability for the IAs sure. to go with the to students to help support, and then the teams really navigate what that would look like so that the student is most successful. Mm -hmm. And I would say the majority of the time, if not all of the time, they start the assistants to go with it and then more back themselves out as they are able, or maybe as the kids are in the older grades, but not so much in, in primary. Right. So I would say that it would be pretty standard for the special education, the self-contained programs and inclusion. Right. And, and then you, what about like the dual language programs? You, you said because that I think this might help with the question of the staffing right? Yeah. like if yeah. there's 28 students and there's 1.5 teachers right then it's a well instructional assistant right plus teacher mm -hmm. that probably qualifies the number a little bit right but we don't have that specification so we don't know is it is it really a, a meet or not a meet in that kind of situation when there's that many students in the classroom and that's the the hope is that the buildings have enough flexibility. I mean, that's what our well, belief yeah. is. They have enough flexibility through the instructional support IA role mm -hmm. to then prioritize exactly what you're talking about. Okay, I know, you know, in, in one building, they may be choosing two students from RISE go into one third grade class and two students go into a different one. Another building may be looking at, it makes more sense the kids are going to go together they're staying and going into one of the classrooms so then it does increase those numbers mm -hmm. more and then at the building level is where they would if they're making that decision would look at the availability of which assistant would be able to go with but there are the instructional support assistants are positions within every building right. so they could have you know use that position as well as a special ed instructional assistant if it was for special programs I, I think sometimes it's, it's, it's so student specific and yeah. activity specific right. that there might be a day where, you know, let's say it's third grade and you're at Kingsley and you're going to send some best students into the general education third grade classroom. Depending on the individual students, what activity they're working on, what kind of day they're having, they might need more or less support. So I think that's where the flexibility comes in and the communication between the staff in the building where they are gonna literally talk about it, maybe on the spot. Do we right. need an aid in this classroom right now or are they better served in this classroom right now? Um, those kinds of decisions are gonna be huge. Um, mm -hmm. And I think also activity specific, like just for example, my son is in the best program, he might be able to go into the regular education PE with no mm -hmm. assistance whatsoever because that's like where he's going to thrive and do wonderful and he's not going to be nervous and he's going to be fine. But put him in the writing portion of the day and he needs someone like sitting right next to him guiding him through. So it, it's so kid specific, activity specific, day specific. But the flexibility I think is such an important part in the communication between the staff in those buildings. It's very hard to just, I think, like Jane was kind of saying, automatically say, well, once we hit X number, we're definitely gonna make sure we always, always, always have an extra person. It might not, that might not be the best use of the staff necessarily, depending on. Oh, right, I think I was just more specifically to something like a dual language program, right? Where you know you're going to have a certain number of students in a dual language, do they need that additional? And I under that, so the answer to my question is, it's very individualized, dependent on the circumstances. Yes. And I would say even <laughs> most likely, I would think it would be, relatively similar with dual language that you're going to have some students who need more support some students who need less support and you know depending on the activity they're working on in the classroom as well they might need more or less so I think it goes probably somewhat the same for all the special programming I would imagine um, but yeah and this is the process that takes place behind the scenes I, I see it every day with you know principals coming in and out of the district office meeting with Jane and meeting with Jessica and meeting with Justin to determine when we do have a specialized program, 
where's the support going to be and, and how are we going to do it and then you start at the beginning of the year and as a former principal I can tell you then two weeks later you're having those same meetings and then another two weeks later you're having the same meetings okay. because you can have a particular student who was very successful in one class at the start of the year but then three weeks later they're not so successful so it is a very very fluid um, process in we don't in, and we can't be in a situation where we're always just going to say because this school has X, then they get Y. Um, right. Sometimes that will happen um, because of the student need, but for the most part, it, it's this constant communication and talking and the articulation from one year to the next that's going to determine it. One of the trickiest places is preschool or kindergarten, mm -hmm. where sometimes you have the first experience of a child, and that's where you can talk about adding, you know, once you start the school year off and things like that because it can be challenging. The one highlight I, I have to give Jane credit for on this because I know we've worked extremely hard. Uh, before I was hired, I kept hearing about combination classes and, and classes that were sharing multiple grade levels. And first, I want to give a shout out to the teachers that, that, that did that. And, and there are, in special programs, sometimes we'll combine multiple grade levels across. But one of the things that we're very proud of, um, Jane alluded to it, we have all the kids in their home school this year, which was huge, trying to get everything uh, working together but also to not put anyone in a position where they're teaching in terms of classroom multiple grade levels at, at, at the same time. I'm talking about classroom settings, not specialized programs. And then also for elementary math, not teaching two blueprints at the same time is also a very big step forward in this and, and it's been a lot of hard work. So thank you, Jane, for, for doing that. Thank yeah, you. this is a great outcome for a neighborhood school model. I, yeah. I, I think people need to realize that other Very districts difficult. don't have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, this this is the reality of the neighborhood school model. Like we're you know we're always going to have schools that you're like wow 200 students and then you got 600 students in other ones. It's it's a challenge. So I, I think this is a great outcome. And the other challenge, and, and I know we've, we've got multiple presentations, so I'll move on. The research behind class size is is, is pretty clear. Once you're getting over that 12 to 13 students, you don't see a huge effect size or a change once you're into the 20s or even the high 20s in terms of that. The biggest determination of student success is the quality of the teacher that they have in front of them. And I'm very proud that we have such high quality teachers. Now, as a former teacher and being married to a teacher, I'm not advocating for putting 30, 35 <laughs> kids in a classroom. I, I won't be able to go home tonight if I do that. But um, we do have to recognize that um, there are different perspectives in our community, there are different perspectives in our staff, there are different perspectives on, from all of us in terms of what is that magic right number that should be in a first grade classroom or should be in a fifth grade classroom. And I think that is another challenge to all of this too, is managing people's expectations and in, in what can work in a classroom. There were years as a teacher where I have a class of 15 and it was a very, very challenging time. Other times I've had over 30 and it was fine and then vice versa. So it really is student dependent on how we make these decisions. Okay. Okay, we shift into middle school. We, um, this chart will show the total enrollment, the grade level breakdown, and then you'll see that Herrick, 70% of the classrooms at Herrick are meeting that that target of 26 or fewer, and 85% in O'Neill. So there's definitely still work here. Um, the middle school schedule is much different than our elementary self-contained classes all day, and so there are a number of factors. So it's still a work in progress. Um, this, we wanted to give you a little bit more detail as you're looking at between Herrick and O'Neill, and again, the neighborhood schools. So we have a middle school of 642 students and a middle school of 424. We have really made a lot of progress in bringing the range closer together between Herrick and O'Neill class sizes and bringing the averages closer together. There still is, is some more work ahead. Um, and there are a number of factors that contribute to that. So when you look at the schedule at first or at, at even the ranges you may think you know you have, we have class sizes of exploratory class at 12 and exploratory class at 30. Um, and, and these these were not errors in the planning they are deliberate decisions and so i wanted to kind of talk through the different factors that go into that middle school schedule so we are looking at and in, in the spring of the year 
are when our student the transition meetings for our students with IEPs so we, we have that factor to really look at how the scheduling the students with IEPs and looking at what their classes and what their schedules would look like and what the need is we also have in the spring where we're getting the data and, and placing students in their math class middle schools have the level the different math courses for the students we have um, gifted ELA that we're using the data to identify the kids that would be eligible for the gifted English language arts class and then we have the exploratory selection of our families meaning that full year foreign language for eighth grade so as we're gathering there's a lot of a lot of moving parts here um, our priority is making sure students have the schedule that's appropriate for them that meets their needs where they can be successful so as we start filling in those pieces and the, the foreign language is a good example um, the foreign language Spanish classes are the reason those exploratories class size the range goes up to 30 you know and years ago we had a conversation as to as a district philosophically are we going to cap the foreign language classes and then it becomes first come first serve for families or as they creep up which is what happens if you're a family that maybe didn't make your selection until late uh, you know are we going to add those those children and let them have this opportunity for four full year foreign language where we landed in our decision making is we don't want to um, deny kids those opportunities and so in working with staff it's yes we're gonna we're gonna let those classes creep up and so some of our Spanish classes or French classes are over the target the other impact to that is that's pulling kids out of the exploratory courses where they would rotate through in a year the I'm trying to think, the family and consumer science class and and so we still have to offer those but that does mean that some of those sections are rather s small at 12s and 14s um, so there's the discrepancy there another um, decision that was a deliberate decision related to math the sixth grade students who go to our middle schools for math we could have balanced those class sizes a little bit better and brought them down if we split kids from their home school and we made the decision of no we want you know all the the children from Fairmount are going to be in that same class at O'Neill all the children from Leicester are going to be in that same class at Herrick and so by doing that we think that was more beneficial for the, the children and their families that did we did allow those class sizes to go a little bit larger so those are some of the reasons why you may see some of those classes that are over the target real um, quick are you doing that for COVID reasons or for kind of the cohesion of keeping them together it's the cohesion of keeping them together the kids being in the, they in the, with their peers with the children they know from their home school if you will call it a home school you know and they're going over to Herrick so that's going to be a challenge that we face it could you year know, after a way year. to yeah. and that's really where the if the class size was the bigger worry or challenge or the higher priority it would mean splitting kids we felt no it's better for our students to be in with their their class it creates some other challenges also on the other side when the kids then travel back <laughs> to their elementary school um, should they have different teachers should they have like splitting them keeps that common teacher Perfect. for the kids to help one another as well. just put another check mark on challenges of the neighborhood school model. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes definitely um, so we are ex we are trying to look at ways um, really to you know we backed up our registration process as early as we think is feasible in the spring but we do want for this coming year want to try to focus on middle school trying to really get some of the those those pieces in place sooner so that we can we can balance the classes better before the year gets underway that some of the challenges the time the time crunch of we're getting numbers in and we're confirming things a day before students are showing up and so we, we're still working to try to back that up so we can better balance the two middle schools um, but that being said we've really made a lot of, of real good progress we feel questions as we look at our total enrollment um, we have the preschool program 
Yeah, that's that's pretty comparable to prior years, maybe a little low, but typically we're at like 160 at the start of the year. And then in our preschool program, kids do register during the year and join the program. By the end of the year, we are typically around 190 to 200 students. And so we'll monitor that this year and see if that, in fact, is the case as well. We have our preschool, or our elementary total. Middle school is, is pretty consistently just over 1,000 students. Our enrollment includes students who are not attending in our schools, or they may not be in our, our programs, such as SASID, or some of our students with IEPs who um, are attending elsewhere, but they're still our, our children. I did look back. Um, I have my enrollment back to actually 1996, I hate to say, <laughs> but even 20 years ago, we were at 4,900 students in 2000, and we've ranged as a district anywhere between 4,700 students and 5,100 students in this past 20 years. So it's for relatively what we would consider stable. And just to piggyback on that, I looked at the 2016 prediction demographer report of where we'd be for middle school it said we'd be at 1044 so you see it's <laughs> 1066 so pretty close uh, for the elementary it said we'd be at 4102 so you can see elementary is a little down uh, but the total was 5146 so not drastically far off we did see that COVID impacted that but we do see our numbers rising back up so all in all pretty close to the prediction obviously not spot on but but as Jane said that enrollment does stay pretty consistent over the decades did it have the breakdown of north versus south for the, the middle school it does and so I, I don't have that in front of me or actually oh, I do you don't have it. in front yeah. of me. <laughs> um, it yeah. does do that we can share yeah, this we share this with the board so you can take a look at it later but um, it was showing much higher on the north side right you know in these years like no that. it certainly showed that the, the shift from my yeah. school yeah. i think I'm just curious if yeah. they had the 50% more at Herrick versus O'Neill prediction do you recall last year's numbers by the way um, it, total enrollment for between Herrick and O'Neill no just total, total number total I no, I, I, it, it's not important. <laughs> so I, many numbers. In my head, that's lower than last year, and I'm just trying to, you know, but, and I think it might be just because generically we say f around 5,000 students, so like, you know, right, um, right. so in my head, I'm trying to remember exactly. We're actually off a little bit. I, I don't have the exact number. I think I shared with the board in an update a couple of weeks ago. I can't recall the exact numbers, yeah, but we can reshare that, that to, to go through everything again. We're up a no, little bit. No, I know it's really close. I was, I was just, you were throwing off so many numbers. Yeah. I was just curious. Well, and, and this is September 1st. I can tell you today's numbers will be different yet again. I mean, we're still. Yeah, I just know that. Adjustments and enrollments. Anecdotally, I, you know, I've run into people on the playground that, that put the, their kids into a private school last year, you know, because they started the year open or, or for whatever reasons. And um, I know a lot of them have come back. So I didn't, you know, I was, I was trying to just do the math in my head. And it was such a weird year last year. I can't, you know, <laughs> I can't quite uh, recall where all that What was. happened last year? <laughs> See me after the meeting. <laughs> year over year, I it's consistent that Herrick has the entire population of El Sierra School more at Herrick than O'Neill. It's literally 220 some, mm -hmm. and it, it's been like that for a couple of years now, consistently. So it's consistent. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think that's dropping. I mean, in the 90s, I know that was flipped. Right, we were much stronger yep. in, on the south side, and and then now turnover started on the north side, and it's probably we probably got at least another yeah. decade and a half, you know. Or well, or so when you hear about when we talk about overcrowding at the middle school, that that like is a metaphor or like an example, like just yeah. saying oh it's really crowded there is not as impactful as hearing the entire population of El Sierra more at right. that school, in my opinion. Just to put that in perspective, when I taught at O'Neill, the middle schools are pretty much balanced. They were about 600 apiece. And so that has changed, um, you know, significantly over the last 20 years. Yep. Sorry, Jane. That's oh, okay. As we wrap up here, um, during this past five years, we've really taken a closer look and prioritized some of our student support <laughs> positions, a number of our student support positions, I should say. Um, and so this is really just that recap. We have 13 reading specialists, one at each school. Um, our reading specialist surveys interventionists as well and could support both reading and math. 
29 resource teachers, but really our reading specialists, our resource teachers, and our intervention support, all of those positions support students flexibly and support as intervention support. So we may have a resource teacher um, and we, we do a calculation to allocate based on caseload and then resource teachers also have that same skill set and the qualities and the training to serve as interventionists. So they may also be serving in the capacity of an interventionist and supporting children who don't have IEPs. Um, for our intervention support, that's something that we Again, our board has prioritized and we are continuing to prioritize and increase over these past few years and expecting that into the, into the coming year. And we have 11 and a half positions serving in that capacity. There are um, some part-time dual roles. So for example, you may have a resource teacher who has a caseload of special ed allocation and is also interventionist half-time. Um, we have three teacher librarians who are serving in this dual role and that helps us have the, the staff members stay at their at a home school if you will and not travel they are providing the direct instruction the library skills instruction and supporting the library they also do though have in their schedule um, an intervention portion where they can support students and so this is that is relatively new this the dual roles and we're continuing to work through um, and best organized staff to make sure that we can provide as much support for children and meet the needs of our kids. Um, we have ten and a half um, EL and dual language teachers. Again, and they, they, many of them can support in either role because they would have the qualifications for dual language as well as EL. EL. Our social workers and psychologists, we have increased um, slightly over the past probably at least five years. I'm looking to Jessica. <laughs> And we're very proud of, you know, being able to have now 23.4, that allocation really to support students, tier two and tier three mental health supports, executive functioning, um, and then that continued dedication to our CSN and RN allocations, making sure we can have a nurse at each school five days per week. And finally, really as we work through this school year, and we're very excited that we're getting back to that more typical type of a school year. Uh, we will continue to monitor our student progress and our student data. We will have more student data this year with kids being in person and administering MAP and AIMS three times this year so that we can continue to monitor, evaluate, reevaluate our needs and adjust our support as appropriate. That was one of the um, worries of many staff members, parents, and I believe some of our board members is to that we should, like coming off the pandemic, we wanna make sure we have appropriate support and we can meet kids' needs. Um, and we are very confident, yes we can, we have dedicated staffing to these positions, but we've also really made that commitment to as we adjust, if we need to adjust in one direction or another, um, during this year or at the end of this year, that yes, we would be prepared to do so. So that's really our work ahead, is just to closely monitor and make sure we have a successful year. Right, questions? Um, actually appreciated the questions throughout. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do have one question, Jane, about, um, we've been, you've been hearing a lot uh, on the news and such about um, instructional assistant shortages, things like that, districts having trouble filling out those positions, and I was just curious how we are doing in that. Um, are we fully staffed in instructional assistants? I mean, obviously we've talked about the importance and how, how much we utilize them to help in all of our classrooms. So how, how is it looking like that with all of it? Not only just instructional assistants, but also speech and language pathologists, occupational therapists, nurses. Do we have backup nurses? All that, like how is that all looking right now? Um, we have speaking, let me start with certified. We are fully staffed in our certified staff um, positions right now. It's when we have a leave of absence, maternity leave. So Jessica's been working very hard with for our, in our special services department to make sure that we have those long-term subs certified for whether it's speech, social work, psychologist. Some of those may need to be contract services to accomplish that, but yes, we are able to fill those. Um, the instructional assistant positions, we are still actively trying to fill some, a number of our positions and during this um, first few weeks of school, we have 
had, in a, even in a normal year, prior to the pandemic, really more flexibility with our, our um, certified specialists to be able to support in all of our classrooms because this is the time when you're really getting to know the kids and building relationships and starting kicking off that school year. Um, and so we've, we've had to flexibly reschedule people to make sure the students do have support. We are um, continuing our outreach to fill and we are prioritizing our special education IA positions first, which would mean if we need, if there's a, an assistant who's providing library support or instructional support not specific to special ed, we would reprioritize their role to support students with IEPs first and then work to fill that, that other role. The other piece, again, in this last few weeks, interventions weren't yet up and running, and so we did have that flexibility. So now it is really um, continuing. We are filling more and more. There's some on the consent agenda tonight and the personnel report. Um, and so and we're continuing to, to interview and expect to get them filled, those positions filled. This Would you say the challenge is more lack of candidates or lack of quality candidates? Like a, if we're getting a lot of applications, they're just not necessarily the right fit or lack of applications? Lack of applicants or people interested. Interestingly, we've been putting in positions for sub-instructional assistance and getting those positions filled and many of those people don't want to commit to working every day. Uh -huh. They still want to have the flexibility, so they're saying, no, I'll work as a sub, I wanna be flexible with my work schedule, okay. um, and are not accepting that full-time position. Okay. So it's more, I mean, we're, we, ex our process, and I, even prior to the pandemic, when we were unable to fill, we would go back to teacher applicants and start calling um, and contacting applicants who maybe were right out of school and didn't get a teaching job, and so we were able to fill some positions that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but even that's becoming more and more, more difficult yeah. as far as lack of people going into <coughs> education in general. Yes. And, and that's the clerical as well. We're having, I mean, similar with, mm -hmm. with filling some of our clerical positions. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that this is the toughest labor market we've ever encountered in education. And yeah. I think that's across many industries, but education in particular. Yeah. Can't hire 14 year olds like McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask questions? Yeah, can I ask a question about our social workers and psychologists? Just uh, as our students are in person this year, um, Great question. how are how might we be, and what are we doing today to be potentially more proactive in pushing in those supports for students or identifying students that might need those supports that may otherwise not trip a flag or otherwise might not. Uh, um, avail of them of those services. Uh, just to be mindful of the fact that most, if not all of our students had a shock in their system in the last 18 months. When I, and I feel like all of our building teams um, that is at the forefront of their thinking and their priorities, not just our related services staff, but our classroom teaching staff, um, the regular, the collaboration, the Professional Learning Mondays actually is a wonderful opportunity because really that's our focus, correct, is making sure Two, that our teams are, are aware and have systems to check in, get to know all of their kids, but also identify any potential areas of concern, partner with families, reach out to families. Do we, uh, I don't wanna put a unjust metric on this, but do, are we seeing a increase in the number of students that are availing themselves of these services? I, I don't think I could speak to that tonight, really. I think it's a little early. I think I certainly think we're going to continue to monitor that through the year. I, I would look at Jessica to see if she's in, yeah. seen an increase right now, but it's still pretty early in the school year yep. to see, um, you know, huge significance. Kids are still kind of establishing themselves in routines. Um, certainly, have we dealt with um, building, you know, concerns and, and helping and assisting students and staff? Absolutely, we have. Um, but I'm not ready to say that we've had an increase from one year to the next. I, I just think it's too early to tell, but I would default to Jessica to see if she has any. Yeah, I, mean, I can say systematically when you're looking at an entire system of adults and students that have really gone through some traumatic events that that you know, it doesn't fall short of what person or really the system. Really, we're looking at it being kind of an office on deck, starting really with our classroom teachers 
and those really strong relationships that they build with their students to help you open their lines of communication and get to know what does a kiddo look like on a typical day versus a day where they're really struggling. And our social workers, our counselors, our psychologists really come in as those mental health professionals to do some of that coaching. But really in our system, we're trying to address it at that full group level and then really using our specialists for those cases that really come more complex and really do need some of that hands-on type of work. Thank you. Anybody else? Good question, correct. Yeah. We talked a lot about it. I'm here for so, it's at, it's, it, we talked a lot about it over the summer and prepping for it. So I guess whether it's anecdotally or what, I guess I would be curious to mm -hmm. hear what is happening in the buildings and how what if you guys need anything from us, like what how we can support or if the social workers or whomever are overwhelmed with extra stuff of unusual like kids that they don't normally see we, i think that's something that we would probably want to know about mm -hmm. okay. great that's a, certainly something we can follow up in an update so thank you for, appreciate thank it you. thank you very much all right we do have a second spotlight on our schedule tonight uh, regarding uh, a later action item in our schedule for a potential partnership with the Village of Downers Grove for a shared administrative facility. So, Dr. Russell. Mm -hmm. I will be given the spotlight and um, I have Todd up here to assist with any questions. For those of you that attend both the village meetings and the school board meetings, this presentation will look very familiar. Uh, the village gave a very similar presentation uh, during the month of August and because it is technically their land and their building that uh, they're discussing, they went first and now we're going second. Um, Prior to me becoming the superintendent, there has been talk about District 58 and the Village of Downers Grove trying to come to a partnership because we have very similar needs in, in aging facilities. Um, it has fizzled away a couple of times. Um, one time they just couldn't make it all work and then the second time was due to COVID-19. But we still continue to share that same desire of not only finding um, updated administrative centers, but also how do we share the cost and um, not overburden our taxpayers. So as we emerge from COVID, uh, we continue to meet with the village and continue to talk with our partners to see if a partnership could be obtained. What we're about to share this evening is by no means a final deal. This is a framework. This is very high level to steal a village analogy. We're at the 50,000 foot level talking about a framework right now. As we continue to have these conversations and drill down to the ground level, that's where we'll have to ensure that the numbers match up, everything works, the design is, is, is uh, you know, favorable for both organizations, and then we may be able to get to a shared facility. But before we get into the presentation, I do again want to emphasize how exciting this is for the Village of Downers Grove and School District 58, and I want to thank our village partners um, for always including us in the conversation because at the end of the day, what's good for the village is often good for the school district and vice versa, and we want to make sure that um, we're good stewards of the taxpayers' money. So with that, let's dive into the, the presentation. Might need you to, uh, there we go. So again, the goal is here to address the village and District 58 facility needs. We wanna maximize value and minimize costs to benefit our residents and taxpayers. The map that you see here is a map of uh, District 58. Uh, you'll see our boundary map now we are not exclusively the village of Downers Grove, even though we're called Downers Grove uh, Grade School District. We do have portions of several communities. The two most significant would be Woodridge and Oak Brook. We do have pieces of both of those communities, but nevertheless, it is dominated, of course, by Downers Grove. Here is the village map. Um, you can see that there are some unincorporated areas here, but the maps look very similar. When you put them on top of each other, this is really, or really where you can see where the partnership would be beneficial. So 93% of the village tax base is located within the boundaries of 58 and 82% of districts 58 tax base is located within the village. So it is a very similar um, footprint so you can see why this partnership uh, begins to make a lot of sense. So what are our needs as a school district? Now these are based on initial conversations with the village so these are very very rough estimates. Um, as we signed a lease with Aramark, our office space was, is going to be about 5,400 square feet. 
What we wanted to make sure is that we kept it very high level and allowed room for growth. And I always use this example. The current building that my office sits in, when I was a, a kid growing up in Downers Grove, was a shared district office between 99 and 58. Everybody outgrew that and 58 stayed and 99 left. Well, now 58 is also spread out amongst the Longfellow Center. So whatever we do here, because we're talking about such a long term, we want to make sure that we leave room for growth. Where did we get the 60 parking spaces? Well, that's a combination of this would be a professional development center, so we would need at least 30 to 35 parking spots for people to come. And then we would also need additional parking spots for visitors and for um, office staff that would be located in the new facility. So when you look at the overall square footage of the building, remember this is a potential school district headquarters village headquarters and then also the police headquarters so you're talking about three entities coming into one although obviously the police fall under the umbrella of the village of downers grove whenever you build a new building you're looking for environmentally sustainable features here's an overview of the parking uh, that the village is proposing and then also you would see an 85 unit apartment building uh, located on the civic center site and we'll get to that in just one second here so here's a map of the proposed uh, village center to kind of orient you where we're at right now. We're a little, uh, you know, near that zone C. So basically you would see the current building that we're in demolished. You would see uh, the police station demolished. The new building would be closer to Washington Street and you would see that be uh, reconfigured. And then the village would sell a portion of this land to build a apartment building. So why do this? Well, if you've got three organizations in your town that are all looking to do the same thing, I think it makes sense to see if we can do this without having to construct all these things on our own. If you look at where we're at right now, partnering with the village and using their facility, the village needs a boardroom, we need a boardroom, but we don't need it on the same night. We don't want to build two if we can just build um, one. Again, that gets to the next bullet point about efficiency does reduce the total construction cost. The more people you can get in, I think that makes sense. Certainly would reduce the tax burden. And it, it allows for potential partnerships down the road, uh, starting to perhaps share things amongst different government agencies. My previous district, we did a lot of this because we were small. We would partner with neighboring government agencies or school districts or special education cooperatives to try and achieve economies of scale. So, in a shared facility, you would have village exclusive space, you would have district exclusive space, and then you would have shared spaces. So we would very much envision this as it's our building um, with all of us together. So lobbies would be shared, hallways, stairways, elevators, cafeterias, break areas, storage areas, council chambers or the boardroom, parking lots, restrooms, and conference rooms. It would very much be a shared use facility where we're all in this together. So what would the village do? Well, they would design and construct the uh, facility with District 58 input. Uh, they would construct and own the facility, and I think that makes sense. After all, it's their land that it's currently on. The village would have to adhere to a schedule, and in exchange, we would lease out a portion of the building. We'd be looking at a 50-year term. Years one, through 20, years one through 25 would be the incremental construction divided by 25 years. Um, and then years 26 through 50 would be 50% of that. Now, attached to this evening's board docs is a sample of what that map would look like. Please know uh, the village used a million dollars. While I wish this building would be a million dollars, it is not gonna be a million dollars. We wanted to put a number on there that was very easily divisible, that it, people could make sense of it, but that is nowhere near an estimate for whatever any of this would cost. We don't have those estimates yet for what it would cost. So please know that was just for informational purposes. But basically, if, if the building cost $100, you would take that $100 and you would divide it by 25 and our lease payment would be $4 a year. There is no increase from year to year to year. Once you got done with the first 25, the second 25, it would be reduced to 50%, which would be $2. And so that would be the arrangement, again, with no annual increases. Now, in order to finance this, one of the things that the village wants to do is to establish a TIF district right here on the Civic Center site. 
So they would actually sell a piece of their land to a private developer and TIF that. We would then waive our right to the TIF or the tuition that we would receive from students who would be in that apartment building over the life of the TIF, which is 23 years. Now to put that in perspective, we have a lot of apartments here in downtown Downers Grove, but we have very few students. The type of apartments and, and the type of residents that they attract are not necessarily people who have kids in school. It doesn't mean that we never have kids in school from you know Maple and Maine or Burlington Station, but it is a very, very small number. And typically what we do see is we see people who are leaving a smaller home in Downers and building a bigger home, and then they live in the apartments for a year while one is being built. That's the most common thing that I've experienced with those. So again, as we get to the next slide, what we would be doing is um, paying for 5% of the design cost. That's not 5% of the build cost. Incremental cost of construction. I wanna be very clear with what this means. Again, I'm using rough numbers, but let's say we did end up needing 7,100 square feet of space. We would pay for what that square footage of 7,100 square feet costs and any additional parking to that. We would not pay for the boardroom square footage. We would not pay for the professional development. Again, in exchange for the TIF. Um, we would have to execute that lease if we signed on to this at the final stage, and we would have uh, to waive the rights from the TIF district, as I shared before. But for the second half of the lease, we would have the ability to capture uh, not only property tax dollars, but also any tuition that we would have deferred. So here you can kind of see the target dates. Um, draft terms of an intergovernmental agreement, the target date, August 2021, that's where we're talking about this framework. Um, then we, if the board would approve, the village has obviously already approved this, then we would start working on an intergovernmental agreement. The lease would come next and then the operating agreements after that. So what are we asking for this evening? Really what we're asking for is that the Board of Education approve the key terms. And the next step would we continue with the design of the facility and we would draft the intergovernmental agreement. Again, by agreeing to a framework, that's all you're agreeing to right now. You're not agreeing to any final dollar amount or any one particular design. It just allows us to continue to move forward with the village of Downers Grove. So again, pretty exciting. Of all the times that I've, I've heard of this partnership or I've been in the district, this is certainly the furthest we've gotten and the closest that we've gotten um, to making this a reality. So certainly exciting, uh, but it, like we always say, it has to be the right deal, it has to make sense, and uh, time will tell as we move forward. So with that, do you have any questions for Todd or I? Any questions? No? Okay. All right, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think that question here is uh, speaking maybe to contingency planning and our abilities mm -hmm. for uh, this this will be the third time in the last seven yeah. years that this idea has been floated uh, and so just being being prepared for the chance that it doesn't pan out um, in that event speak to some of the options that are available to us yeah so I, I appreciate you bringing that back up because um, by no means is this a done deal and if, if the board recalls I want to say it was perhaps the April or May presentation when we were talking about long-term plans for an administrative center in the district we had talked about um, one of the options being a partnership with the village we had also talked about um, you know building our own facility we had also talked about um, going into one of our schools and so very much those are still on the table um, we have signed a seven-year sublease and, and that was by design keep in mind we have um, early out options available to us in that sublease in the event that this does come to fruition. We have a nine month um, notice that we have to provide here. But Karat, um, the other options that we've been exploring uh, through the master facilities task force are still available and, and still part of the conversation, uh, whether that would be to build our own facility or whether that would be to go into a school that perhaps is underutilized and then you could use that facility uh, as well. So both of those options are still there. Obviously, I think the um, structure of this deal and the financing um, and the framework that it looks like it could take shape to really um, 
leads us to, to put this number one. Um, but that being said, that a lot of things still have to be worked out and there are contingency plans in place. Um, should this not come uh, to fruition? And what is our first, right now we are agreeing to framework. Mm -hmm. There's no financial outlay today. No, the only what will be the cost, first financial outlay? The only cost that you could potentially start incurring, depending on how fast the design moves, is that 5% design cost. So as we sit down with the architects from the village and start to talk about in drawings and things like that, not 5% of, the, again, the total cost, but that would be a potential commitment that um, you could not start to incur some uh, fees with. But again, um, we're still a, a pretty long way away from that. We're still in the conceptual uh, conversations with the architects there. So what I would say is, you know, once we have this framework, then we'll sit down with the village and really start going over the intergovernmental agreement. And before we get serious with the design phase, I'd like to have that um, pretty close to that. So I don't want to start incurring a lot of costs unless we're certain that this is, you know, something we want to pursue. Yeah, I think one of the things that I'm going to look for in future, mm -hmm. you know, financial outlays are, is going to be the uh, impact of the current um, condos, apartment buildings on the student population. Mm -hmm. I know that we I know that it's nominal currently, but just to know what's the potential size of the new building, what's the potential impact on the school, how many potential students, mm -hmm. um, based on what we know, maybe some kind of a, a demographic report on that. And, you know, I don't know who, what companies the village is looking at or what kind of a building they're intending on building, what the rent, rent ranges are going to be. Those are the kind of the numbers I'm going to be maybe wanting to see a little bit more of to understand um, whether or not that IGA can actually come to fruition. I think, the, I think the key terms, it makes sense to say, okay, we're willing to, to waive those, but we're not agreeing that we're going through with this final, that's going to be contingent upon us maybe seeing some more of those solid numbers. And when, when I shared earlier number of students, I believe when I looked at this last year, and please don't hold me to this number, I can go back and, and verify. I think yeah. we were talking about five students as an example in those two apartment sure. uh, buildings that I shared. So if they're in line with the current number of students, or, or excuse me, the current um, apartments that are being built in Downers, I wouldn't right. expect a huge influx, but one of the things that we've discussed doing anyway is an updating of our demographer report you know mm -hmm. some of the re report that i had referenced earlier in terms of the predictions on where we would be just because of the impact of COVID 19 and um, the housing values and things it, it may be worth our while to go ahead and just take a look at that demographer re report or update that report uh, to ensure that we don't end up with this influx of students that we couldn't uh, you know take on right right and some of that will be just reflected by whatever the building that's getting built is going to what? be how many you know is it three bedroom units what's the rental rates what is it going to be consistent with something like burlington or maple and maine or is it going to be something different or has does the village know do they even know what it's going to be and, and all that will continue to be flushed right. out and i will exactly. say that we always have a member from this board who serves as an ex officio <laughs> on those I, I think it's member i'll check right now yeah. to, to kind of take a look at those um as they're being proposed to give them so input. steve that's a yeah and i'll actually see. echo your question because yeah. there was a development that came up about six months ago and it was a number of apartments and that was the question i asked and then yeah. to your point I, I think i got anecdotal uh, right. evidence that came back I, I think it'd be good to kind of have you know this development we've had x number of students over mm -hmm. the life I, I think we kind of get to that level of detail but I, I think high level like we all know that it's you know it's people moving from one house to the other or young professionals without kids but if we can kind of have something a little bit more tangible that mm -hmm. kind of supports that to say hey it's out of these 50 apartment buildings there was two students over the last five years right like i think having that level of detail will um make us more comfortable Sure. Yeah. Cause, I mean, we are looking at that's what 23 years out. We don't know what the, you know, that's a lot of that's a lot of time for sure. things to change. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that would be nice to have something a little more solid on. Absolutely. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. And the advantage here too is we have a seat at the table of the creation of a uh, yeah. of a tip, which usually school districts don't necessarily have all that in place. So uh, <laughs> again, very high level. Um, I want to be very clear that the board is not committing to any long-term partnership here but certainly exciting times um, for the village of downers grove and school district 58 if we could um, combine our two government agencies here i think it would be a, a, a huge win for everyone but it's got to be the right deal for both okay. 
you used two different words, and um, and so I, I guess I'd like a little bit of clarity. At one point, we talked about it being waived, and at another point, you said the word deferred. Um, which is it waived, or is it, or is it? Deferred? So you deferred. would be. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. If you sign on to this framework, and in, in it ultimately, you know, we, we went through everything and signed on right. the dotted line, we would not have access. So. We're waiving our right to any money that we would get from the TIF for tuition of students. Perfect. Right. That was what I expected, but I heard yeah. the word deferred, and I just wanted to. I think <laughs> perhaps, and sure. who knows what I said, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the second half of the the, the TIF, or, or once that TIF is expired years, after 23 years, then you have access mm -hmm. to that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. All right, we're going to move on to reports to the board. Uh, kicking us off is Dr. Russell with the superintendent report. <laughs> Hello again, everyone. Um, <laughs> for the superintendent's report, every year we have a mandatory personnel or personnel reports that we have to publish. So I want to notify the public that in accordance with the Illinois School Code, the district has also posted two reports or will post two reports. The first one is the IMRF compensation report. That's the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund. Uh, that would be uh, for employees like our secretaries or our custodians or our instructional assistants that must be posted on the website within six business days after the budget is passed and we will comply with that statute. Uh, the second one is the teacher and administrative compensation report that must be sent to the state board by October 1st and again we'll have that posted on our website our target date is this Wednesday of September 15th. In terms of curriculum instruction next month the district will host a curriculum workshop. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn more about our programming and assessment results. Please stay tuned to 58 Connects for more information. I'd also like to remind everyone that the district will administer the mandatory state assessment, the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, or IAR, starting next week. Please note this is last year's assessment that the district opted to administer this year, so we didn't take away any further from in-person instruction last spring. We had the option to give it in the spring. We had the option to give it in the fall, and here we are in the fall, and so we'll administer that. The district, again, will administer this assessment at its normal time for this year later in the spring. As a reminder, the district and community significantly changed how this assessment is approached. We keep hearing things like, why are the grade school rankings this or that from, uh, from many of our community members? Keep in mind those rankings that you often see online are from the 18-19 school year. And what we've seen is those rankings continue to improve because when the IAR, the old park test first came out, we had a large number of people who would opt out or perhaps not um, you know, really take this assessment as serious as I believe we should have at that particular point. So we've completely changed our philosophy as a school district over you know, almost the last eight to 10 years on this assessment. And we're gonna to continue to work with our staff, never to teach to the test, but to certainly prepare our students for what assessment they're about to take to make sure that they can be as successful as they certainly um, can be. In terms of student services, the Individuals with Disabilities <coughs> Education Act, or IDEA, requires all states to make annual determinations on the performance of each local education agency, or LEA with regard to the provision of special education and related services. These determinations are based on indicators identified by the federal government and delineated in its state performance plan. I want to congratulate Jessica Stewart on her leadership. Once again, the district received the highest ranking uh, for our LEA, and so congratulations, Jessica. That's very good news. So we are in complete compliance and received the highest ranking possible. I'll skip over finance for obvious reasons uh, tonight. We just had our budget hearing. Uh, for technology, I want to uh, thank James Eichmiller and his team for all the hard work getting everything ready this school year. The school year was particularly challenging just because of the late number of students registering. Uh, typically, we have a lot of that wrapped up, but because of COVID, um, everything went off very successfully. Uh, but like every year, we will uh, sit back. We are in the review process to make sure that we can continue to make it better and more refined as we move on. Uh, but when you think about the number of student devices that were at home, and then had to come back and get updated and re-imaged. Uh, James, your team did a very nice job making sure all of that was together. I know what that looked like the week before school, getting everything in place, so uh, thank you to you and your team. In terms of facilities, I'm pleased to report we recently held the uh, grand opening of the new Highland Playground. 
Um, got a little scary there with the thunderstorm, but we just missed it and we're able to get through it. Uh, actually, it was so hot out, it felt pretty good when, it, when we did get rained on a little bit. Uh, big thank you to all of our vendors, staff, and parents involved with the Highland Elementary uh, project uh, to make that happen. Special note of thanks to Climb Higher at Highland for all of their hard work uh, and to Principal Kraft for making that uh, project a reality. The flooring contractor has finished their work in the Henry Puffer basement and the three O'Neill classrooms. The new flooring in O'Neill looks very nice and will serve those rooms for some time. The Puffer lower level has been completely transformed and now houses the library and gifted classrooms. So if you were in the Puffer basement before with the carpeting and the gray, the walls have all been repainted, the tile floors down there, it does look very nice and inviting and they're doing a great job with that new space. So we're really happy to see that. In terms of public relations, I'm happy to share that the Education Foundation of District 58 will bring back their annual Oktoberfest to downtown Downers Grove this weekend, September 17th and 18th. This annual fe er, festival is our foundation's biggest fundraiser and all proceeds go to support uh, district programs. So if you're able to attend, we'd really appreciate it. And if you're able to volunteer, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, there are slots open on Friday and Saturday night. Uh, tickets can be purchased as you walk up uh, to the event. So please do that. And on a final note, I'd like to congratulate Megan Hewitt. Megan and our communications team, which really is Megan Hewitt, um, won two <laughs> awards. <laughs> She's a one-person team, but it's a good team. And uh, they won two awards from INSPRA, which is the PR association for the state of Illinois, uh, for our 58 Connects newsletter and our 58 Communicates. And so thank you uh, to Megan for a job well done, and congratulations on your award. She's over there. I'm wondering what she's That concludes my report. I have a question for you, Carlos. Yeah. Um, the, this upcoming administration of the IAR, sure. it was intended to be administered in the spring, mm -hmm. but we're now we're, we're doing it in the fall. So I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around how do we understand this data? So a couple of questions. Like, um, our eighth graders are now ninth graders, so we can't test them. Yeah, they are being tested. So, they, so they're, we're going to own their data. They're going to take the... They're gonna yeah, take North... The, or, yeah. So a couple, couple clarifying points. Um, <laughs> we have to offer the test to students who are in District 99. Justin and his team since last spring have been working that out with District 99 and District 58. And so our um, ninth graders will have the opportunity to take the test. Um, but you are correct. Everyone who is taking that test is now in the next Wasn't grade. Have the opportunity. So if someone isn't there or they choose not to take okay. that test, remember you can, there are So there's going to be time designated that, so. in, the, in the 99 day for freshmen to be taking our test essentially. Yes, and then in other opportunities, I'm going to let Justin uh, share that specifically. And while Justin is coming up, when this assessment, uh, the state said it's mandatory for everyone to do it, remember that that data does not count necessarily for or against you as a um, school district. Um, because of the pandemic, they said everyone has to take the assessment, but the data is not going to count. So we're not going to get ESSA designations? You are not going to get ESSA designations. Those designations will roll over. One of the outstanding questions that all school districts still have is what about growth and how are they going to factor their growth score in? So that's a question that everyone still has that the state has yet to provide us with clarity on. So all, all of our buildings that were um, commendable and exemplary as of in, in testing year 2019 they're going to still this will be the third year they're going to have those same designations things will continue to roll okay. over that so it won't be until a year from now when we're, when we're for the first time we're talking about new designations for our buildings again i need to be careful because the state has not shared that that will actually happen okay so um there are still many outstanding questions that every school district has and that is one of them and just briefly for the current ninth grade students, the District 99 is going to utilize three of their late arrival Mondays and run transportation and bring the District 58, uh, the students who came through Herrick and O'Neill in on those mornings to administer the math assessments. Those take 60 minutes to administer so they can fit it within that time frame using their typical arrival time instead of their late arrival time. We're supporting them with staff to help proctor and then work through the assessment. We are offering six sessions on Saturdays and Monday afternoons. 
to, at, to administer the English language arts portion of the assessment. Students only need to arrive for two of those, but they are 90 minute assessments, so they didn't fit into the, the District 99 window. What we didn't want to see was a situation where former District 58 students were missing academic instructional time in District 99 in order to take this assessment. So that's why we approached it in those, in those two ways. And it, it is, as Kevin mentioned, some of the, the accountability pieces have been waived. The 95% participation rule has been waived for this administration. We certainly, again, this data will be part of our records, so we are encouraging everyone to, to take the assessment and hoping that that will happen, but we also are not going to be subject to any penalties, for example, if many of our current or our former students who are now ninth graders wouldn't be able to make some of those sessions here in District 58. So at least looking at some of the data, we have to take a couple things in consideration. One, this, this is uh, not usually administered at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So we are um, not used to, we have to account for some learning loss over the summer. But also for our ninth graders at least, we have to expect that quite a few of them may not take it, especially since it's not, if for the reading section it has to be done basically on their own personal time. Right, and what's unclear is when we'll get these results back from the state. Obviously we know the window to expect when we have the, for the spring data, it comes to us in late August and then we, it's publicly released in October. I, I can't imagine with the state testing window ending October 8th that that data will be released at the same time. I'm happy to be surprised if that is the case. But so once we get that data, I think that's the point where we will share it with the board and then the community and contextualize it exactly in that way. I think much of the data of the last 18 months is going to have a series of asterisks and things around it as we look to, sure. to the future. And again, the, the decision here to take this assessment we talked a great deal about this in the spring. It was that trade-off where we finally got our kids back, you know, for full days or the greatest extent possible. Do we really then want to throw them in all of this state testing? And so there was no right or wrong decision as we move forward, but, but that was the reason why we pushed it off to, uh, to the fall. Mm -hmm. um, we also, though, to ensure that we get an accurate assessment of where our students are at or where they're performing at in terms of growth and achievement. We never really rely on the IAR all that much for that data anyway. That's why we did implement fall map this year, just to make sure that we had that one reliable, consistent, on grade level data point for all of our kiddos. Thank you. Anything else? You read my mind, Todd. Welcome back up for the uh, monthly business and treasuries report. You have the year to date report. Uh, I'll be short and brief. Right. Uh, you have the year to date report. The one thing you might notice is a little increase in property taxes. That's because the county treasurer did adjust the collection system or distribution, uh, and we had one less distribution in June, uh, in May and June, and it came in the first part of July, so you have that shift. Uh, obviously, in audit, we move modified accrual and we'll adjust accordingly as we usually do. Uh, but on a cash basis, that's why you're going to see an increase in revenue for a little while compared to prior year to date. With that, if there are any other questions, uh, you have some items on there uh, for surplus list and uh, IMRF uh, agent and, and so forth um, on, on your action items. And if there any other questions, but Kevin Bardo has about, he told me, 60 second construction update. <laughs> any questions? No. Okay. No. All right. Good evening. Dr. Russell uh, updated on a couple projects that are completed. Also wanted to provide uh, information on others that are still ongoing. So we do have contractors working on several items, uh, mostly behind the scenes. Uh, early morning or second shift hours required for most of these tasks. Um, some, item, some items do require daytime shifts um, as necessary. But for the mechanical projects, we're confident many of these tasks will be addressed very soon. Um, however, we also anticipate some growing pains as closeout arrives. For the Henry Puffer uh, primary uh, playground pavement and the Herrick pavement, uh, all the work has been completed with the sec exception of a couple of minor items. So we anticipate their final invoice coming here at the October board meeting. Uh, Kingsley Technology, uh, we still need to perform the final startup and testing of the generator. We're currently investigating uh, an off hours time frame to get that work completed. The reason for that is during the day is not an option due to the large trucks and equipment that are necessary around the school. 
The Fairmont Mechanical Project, contractors, contractors have been working from 3.30 to 10.30 p.m. on the equipment installations. Uh, they've been doing a good job with keeping the spaces and classrooms clean and organized after they're done. We expect their work to continue this week and then we'll still have testing, balancing, and controls related work in the upcoming weeks. Pierced on a roof, the contractor received the shipment of architectural sheet metal last week and began installation. Uh, they've been performing the installation from 3.30 to 7 on weekdays and also on Saturdays. And the final project still ongoing is the Pierce Downer Mechanical Equipment, um, which has all the major components in place, but we still need some uh, more time for testing and balancing along with the HVAC controls. So there's still quite a bit of work on some of these as project closeout uh, gets going. Kevin, is there any... Is there any overage costs on any of these projects that we should be aware of, or are they are on the original uh, budgeted expense and costs? So we're sitting uh, very well with all the costs. We don't have any overruns. It's more of a timing issue. Yeah. Um, some of those equipment delays. Um, there's a couple outstanding discussion items between the roof project and the mechanical project as to which party um, is. Uh, so we'll have to sit down and, and discuss that one. Mm -hmm. For the most part, everything is, is really good. Um, no extra cost. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. All right, next up is the policy committee who met on August 17th. Uh, Vice President Harris. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as, as you mentioned, that we met on August 17th for the first uh, meeting of the new uh, school year. Um, this was a uh, meeting where we sat down, we looked at the quarterly press updates, um, there are a whole number of um, policies you'll see in front of you that we're presenting to you for first reading. Um, we um, went through them each at one at a time. Many of them were just uh, were required to you on, on, a, uh, on a, um, a rolling basis and made no changes. None were recommended from the administration. Uh, some of them are just uh, some, some quick language updates. Uh, one of them, 7200, uh, is just a, a simple typo that we corrected from IS, IASB. Um, nothing really controversial, nothing really generated any large amount of discussion. Uh, so um, we are presenting them for first reading tonight. Anything to add? Ditto. All right, then is there a motion to approve for first reading draft policies 110, 120, 130, 210, 230, 2130, 330, 510, 6100, 6145, 6160, 6170, 6235, 6255, 6260, 7200, 7220, 7230, 7280, and 890. And place them on the October board agenda for final adoption. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on those? No. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the first reading of draft policies 110, 120, 130, 210, 230, 2130, 330, 510, 6100, 6145, 6160, 6170, 6235, 6255, 6260, 7200, 7220, 7230, 7280, and 890, and place them on the October board agenda for final adoption. Anything else, Greg? No. Awesome. The legislative committee did not meet in July. Uh, the financial committee did meet. Uh, and for the most part, a lot of, well, you, you've already heard a lot of it today. We re-reviewed the 2021 through 22 budget uh, and talked about some of the same kind of conversations that we had in here today. The impact on the five-year plan, the impact on that 35%. Um, fund balance policy, uh, et cetera. We talked about the year-to-date report, which very briefly, um, uh, Kevin or Todd mentioned that there was a change in the delivery dates of the distribution of some of our property tax revenue. The only thing I want to add to that is what we don't know is if that's a permanent change that now year over year that will balance out or if, if uh, that's going to roll back at, at some point. So next year, they may align or we now said next year at the beginning of the year look down because we had a speculative. Um, we're not 100% sure on that, but it's the same amount of money. It just trickled over into the, the new fiscal year. Um, I, I won't go too in, into this because uh, Greg will I'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, we, we talked about the impacts uh, of uninsurance rates and what that means uh, for budgeting for us. 
And then we also talked and had a nice discussion in the FAC meeting about the potential partnership uh, with the village that we have uh, later on on today's agenda, as the FAC has been a big part of the conversation uh, with the sale of Longfellow, um, the rental property, and all of our options, including uh, working with the village. Um, anything else to add, Steve? No, I just want to emphasize, I, I think the Village of DG partnership was discussed you know, very briefly, but I think the, it should be noted that the reception was very positive to the, the key terms about the, the lease of you know, years one through 25 and beyond. So, uh, you know, obviously we'll be bringing back more information as it develops, but the uh, initial reception was very positive. Thank you. And I would say the Village Council was, was pretty much the same way. Agree with that as well. Any questions? All right, well then that concludes my report. Uh, next up, we have the district leadership team that did Which not meet. did meet, oh, okay. sorry. Um, so uh, <laughs> they met on uh, yeah, August 30th. Uh, Member Weiner. Uh, Karat's gonna do today's report. Oh. So Doshi? a couple of, uh, the district leadership team structure is typically a space for uh, Kevin and the administrative team to provide an update on each of the three goals as part of our strategic plan. Goal one, focus on learning. Goal two, connecting the community. Goal three, securing the future. Uh, I won't go into the details on each of those, but I'm gonna focus specifically around uh, the focus on learning and then also the strategic plan as a whole. Uh, we uh, received an update uh, about the focus on learning from Justin uh, and the a really thoughtful process that him and his team are going through in terms of developing uh, KPIs or KPIs on learning performance. Uh, those uh, key performance indicators expired as of last year, if I remember that correctly. And uh, this year we don't have academic targets in our strategic plan. And so uh, he's uh, putting together a very thoughtful approach to uh, rather than just simply copy paste or linearly extend, uh, which is often the short term solution to really think about what does it mean to focus on learning as we continue to uh, evolve as a school district. And so we've talked a lot about uh, as a board up here uh, and in other spaces about achievement and growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about social emotional learning. Uh, we've talked about um, other ways in which we can measure whether our learning programs are functioning, functioning well. Uh, and so he's uh, engaging uh, with uh, uh, conversations on potentially uh, bringing in a consultant that can help us think through how do you measure these aspects of a school district really well um, and that can help inform where we go in terms of our focus on learning KPIs so that's uh, one piece of the puzzle the other piece of the puzzle is uh, our strategic plan expires next year and the guiding light for uh, the DLT has been that strategic plan and so I think as a board it's going to be helpful for the administration for us to uh, discuss and give signals around how we want to approach the next strategic planning process for District 58. Uh, we don't have to make a decision right now. We don't have to make a decision in the next 15 days. But in the next month or two, we should discuss uh, what that looks like and give Kevin and his team some signals around what are our, where's our sentiments landing uh, in terms of how to go about the next strategic planning process. Uh, and so we kicked off that discussion, but really thought we should bring it to the board and so that's that's the report from that meeting and happy to take any questions so how do we move forward on that like do we dedicate time like yeah meetings what's what's kind of the procedure on on that kevin do you want to chime in yeah so there's um a couple of different things you can do to to first have the initial uh conversation the first thing i would recommend is, is a board discussion so um you you've got opportunities at the october not or the november meeting in, in Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> You've got opportunities at the October or November meeting um, for a board discussion. The thing about our strategic plan is it's not necessarily tied to a school year. It's tied to a calendar year. And so going back in 2018 when it was adopted, the framework was adopted in the spring of 18. Um, and then the summer of 18, the working groups got together and really hammered it out. And then the fall of 18 during the 18-19 school year it was solidified and moved forward. So if you're gonna follow a process similar to that, to renew this one, one of the things that I would recommend is by the December meeting, January at the latest, um, you direct our team to put forward what we call an RFP, which is a request for proposal. And that's after the board has had a couple of conversations about what it would like to see. 
then you put out the RFP and you get responses from uh, groups that can help you with the strategic planning process and getting that input from the community. And then late winter and early spring, you schedule those community forums that get together and set the priorities and, and, and uh, advise the board on the priorities and in, in, in where we want to go. And um, then you finalize that over the summer and then implement it in the fall. So I would suggest that either at the October or the November meeting, the board has a lengthy discussion in terms of the strategic plan. Typically what boards of education will do is they'll talk about their current plan, what they like, what they don't like about it, and some things that they'd like to see moving forward. And we can certainly structure a conversation around that. Um, but I can continue to collaborate with the board president in terms of the agenda planning on whether or not you want to have that at the October meeting or the November meeting to start those conversations. Um, but certainly, uh, the DLT team talked about, and I think rightfully so, about having those conversations uh, with the board, uh, or excuse me, by the board uh, this fall. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and last, last time around we had what was called the Meet and Confer Committee, which eventually sunset and became DLT. This time around we are at sort of an advantage in, in a lot of ways that we already have a district leadership team in place. So my guess is that a lot of these people would probably be interested in, in continuing the work that they're they're doing on the front obviously that could be a discussion that you that you have there um, I think another interesting perspective on this is going to be uh, where we are in the cycle of starting to generate those KPIs and bringing in that um, that potential consultant you know is there a baseline test that we want to spend a little bit of time and work with that consultant and, and get a baseline run of one year on, on those KPIs before we reach out to the public if we're looking at a shift of balancing and looking at both achievement and growth in SEL and, and some of those components. I, I do look forward to that, that conversation and then um, hearing from you guys as well on the advantage to potentially getting some of that information uh, and kind of do a, to, do a test run for the, the final year and then do something later or is it worthwhile to do those in, in, in conjunction? Um, uh, as well so I, I think that would be but I'm, I'm excited for this I think that if you look back obviously item number three is uh, st still got a lot of work left on it but one and two look drastically different than, than when that strategic plan set out so I think that I want to commend the work of this district for a lot of growth I mean we've implemented new curricula in across the district we have one left you know to kind of test pilot this year and and every, everybody's gotten a full cycle change so um but yeah october looks pretty full if i'm looking at our calendar but uh we, we can talk and maybe get get something under the the november uh board meeting if, if that makes sense to the dlt team yeah when is our melissa when is our november dlt space is it pre-board or post-board meeting let me check I think it's I feel post. like it's post. Um, I want to say around the 13th or 15th. And would your goal it's be to 15th, have we'll us see. have that conversation prior to you going back to the DLT? I think so. I think, yeah, absolutely. So what if it's November, as long as it's pre-DLT space, and that makes sense? So right now you're on schedule to do that. Uh, the November board meeting is the 8th, and the DLT is the 15th. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I defer to Darren your judgment on the October versus November schedule, but either one should work for us. Either will work for you. All right, yeah. perfect. So well, Kevin and I will sit down and just, and just verify. I just we've been already kind of pre-working some of the October agenda, and uh, I know we got quite a bit on there. So I want to make sure that um, that we talk about this with a fresh mind and not at the end of a of a long night where we're you know exhausted. So. I think this is important and then Steve to answer your your question too if that's not enough time I have worked with uh, prior boards that would then say you know we need to schedule a special meeting to continue the conversation sometimes it is enough time uh, but certainly we want to make sure that we don't rush that so um, we are more than okay with scheduling additional times if needed I have full confidence in there. <laughs> <laughs> anything else no, that was it. Tracy, did I miss anything? Nope, good. Awesome. All right, we have the Health and Wellness Committee. Uh, Vice President Harris. So I have been, um, it's been my pleasure for the last year or so to um, bring to this board very rosy 
health and wellness um, reports. <laughs> That's um, not a good start. This is, this is uh, yeah, I'm breaking that 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 huh. that, um, that, that streak there. Um, July of 2021 um, was, as it was explained to me, um, it, we, we hit a record in terms of um, amount of claims uh, amount of claims paid out in that month. Um, so that has uh, uh, essentially July was was the equivalent of two normal months. So that does not uh, um, uh, that, that doesn't um, look uh, you know hopefully it's an aberration, and we can when we get the August data we'll, we're going to have one more meeting before the next uh, board meeting. Hopefully August will will come down to earth a little bit, uh, but we have to um, prepare that things have shifted in terms of how we we looked at um, at our, our plans for last year and at the MRF. Um, last year we had a, a very very nice surplus. This year we are kind of teetering in between having a a, a deficit um, of about two hundred thousand any, uh, dollars, anywhere from there up into a surplus of about a hundred thousand um, dollars. The um, the universal plan. One thing we we're looking at is just like that the amount, the total cost per employee. That amount, um, at least trending through uh, the July data, that amount is trending um, to like a, about a 25 percent increase over the actual numbers for calendar year uh, 2020. So that um, you know, that gives us pause. Uh, the HSA is performing well. Um, it's, tre it's trending uh, a little bit better than it was um, against the actuals for last year. Um, we do have four plans. Um, we, you know, for all intents and purposes, we, we do tend to think of them in terms of just having two plans because of the enrollment on the, on the two plans are, are very small. One of them we just have because we have to be um, compliant with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but at least in terms of understanding that we had a very large deficit, or excuse me, surplus last year. We had a very, very um, bad July. But right now, the, the recommendation coming from uh, used to be group alternatives. Assured partners now is um, an 8% increase for all of the plans, except for the HSA plan, which would be held flat. Um, again, we have one more uh, health and wellness meeting before the October board meeting. That'll be um, on September 30th, and we will have August data at, at that time to look at before um, the final recommendation comes in. This board at the October meeting will take action on rates for uh, effective January 1. So um, we will um, we will discuss that one more time as a committee, and the recommendation will come um, to us to vote on at the next meeting. Thank you. Any uh, questions? <coughs> Thank you, Greg. All right. It is now time for us to move on to the public comment portion of the evening. Um, this is a last call for cards, and if anybody has not submitted a card yet that would like to make a public comment, uh, please do so now. All right, this is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Uh, please remember that criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allocated 30 minutes for public comment tonight. Um, we ask that you keep your comments to three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. I currently have received five cards. We will ask that each person who submitted a card to please come to the podium, state your name and your attendance area, and then provide public comment. Melissa Kaphan. Yes. Welcome. Melissa Kapheim. I'm the uh, proud mom of a second grader at Leicester. Uh, my family and I just moved to Downers Grove at the end of June, and so this is our first time in District 58. We're super excited about it. Um, so I just had a few questions, and I apologize since I am new and this is my first meeting. I tried to catch up on a few of the board meetings and amazing emails that Megan sends out, but if these things have been discussed prior, um, I do apologize. So. One of my questions is whether or not vaccines are going to be mandated among staff and teachers. Um, if not, if disclosures are going to be um, asked for staff and um, uh, teachers to be given to the school and then how that will be addressed. Um, and then also I read that there was some testing that was supposed to be done, but that maybe fall, fell through. Um, but there are, um, you know, the state of Illinois has made um, programs available to everyone. Um, my 
three-year-old school has one. It's the, um, I totally just spaced the name of it, but I just wanted to make sure that there are other things in process to look into that, and it wasn't just a one um, off with the hospital because there seems to be lots of other free programs that we should look into and get it up and running on the uh, sooner side. Mm -hmm. My last comment um, is that I actually tried to get my son into the preschool here and I was told that it was full. Um, I was on the waiting list and then they told me I wouldn't get through. Um, so maybe if those numbers could be followed up on. Um, also, I find it slightly, um, I find it extremely interesting that in a school district uh, that pre full time, full day preschool would not be available yet. The amount of research, which I'm sure many of you uh, have lots of advanced degrees, shows how much a full day of four year old and even a half day of three year old preschool does long term for students. And I think if the city of Chicago can offer a full day uh, four year old preschool, I hope Downers Grove can do the same. And I think that's got to be top of our priority for the next coming years. I actually don't know how there isn't a line of other parents here demanding that we have full day four year old preschool, even on a sliding scale. But it needs to be done. Um, and I would appreciate if that was on a future board meeting agenda. With that, I will curtsy my way out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and Melissa. We'll go ahead and uh, we have your email address in here. We'll follow up with those uh, on your questions. Okay. Uh, Porus. Sorry, I can't quite read your last name. That's okay. That was quick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about closing the gaps. I don't know if the gap is at 58 or at 99 or at the university level. The goals stated in your annual report stay focused on learning connecting the community and securing the future. Your report gives us the scores on math and reading, but not on science. Expenditures are around 14,000 in Downers Grove and 18,000 in Hinsdale, and we're getting a great bang for the buck. 62% of the teachers have an MS, de MS degree. But in the competitive world, there is a big gap. For example, the gap Total gap between China and USA is 242. The total gap in reading is 56. The gap in math is 113. And the gap in science is 73. I don't know if these gaps start at the 58 district and continue in 99. <clears throat> this continues in college where the graduation rate in the United States is 60%. University of Illinois circle is at 58%. China, on the other hand, is at 90%. What can we do to reduce the gap? Could the answer be tiger moms, helicopter dads, or chicken blood? In the USA, we've polled 2,000 2, children in, six, in 80 chapters, and the concerns will be covered in this presentation. I will expre express how we, a few points on how we can improve. Cultural diversity was addressed last month when I came. And I will contact and work with uh, Mr. Justin Sissel. However, we need to prepare our students not only for District 58 and 99, but in, in the real world of the United States and close the gap. The students in our reports indicate there is a rise of, of anxiety, depression, and suicides. And this increase is double digits to, to almost 20 to 30 percent because of COVID-19 and currently virtual running, learning. Looking at numbers globally, China is at a 12.1 rate. USA is at a 16.1, 25% uh, to 30% higher than the rest. We need to close this gap, and we need to provide mental services, especially during this time. The, the second complaint, the second interest of the students was they are seeing fires in the Northwest and the carbon absorbers are being the carbon spreaders. 
So the students are concerned with filtration, air systems, water, and are concerned about the environment and are expressing their concern for being problem solvers. The other problem they are indicating is food scarcity. We, I noticed that in our annual report, we have 140, uh, 140 people served. But how do we raise the test scores? The test scores can be raised by parent volunteering, parent mentoring, in reading math and science. And what I see in the report is teacher-parent conferences. We need to do more. We can teach soft skills like time management, executive skills, teamwork for learning, Singapore math. We can benchmark against the best. We can look at the Lincoln model or the Malcolm Baldrige Award. We are looking at communications, and you are indicating that communications are done through computer and internet learning, whereas the children are, are saying in their essays that they would like to see even the cell phone use or the WhatsApp use, and they are giving us examples in it. Finally, I would suggest that you are the experts on education, and maybe you can come up with better solutions. Thank you for your time. Sorry for going over. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that you sent us an email that we were unable to open the attachments at this point. I think you were going to go uh, ahead and... I, yeah, I will resend it. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Sewell from Whittier. Good evening. Brian Sewell. I have two daughters from Whittier. I want to remind parents that <clears throat> District 58 will start its DEI audit process in September. While we do not teach critical race in Downers Grove, it will undergird the entire DEI audit. CRT forms the backbone of the DG99 DEI process and audit. You should check out the 106 pages of racial profiling found on the DG99 Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion audit uh, website. I've got it right here. Um, the academic citations in DG99's recently completed audit are by D'Angelo and Kendi with calls to disrupt any form of isms, racism, classism, sexism, normative beliefs associated with heterosexuality, the cisgender, and on and on and on and on it goes. 106 pages of CRT complete with references to the oppressed and the oppressors. We, be, we will be told by the district that it is under no obligation to adopt the recommendations. We will be told by the, we will be told the Twitter feed of the principal consultant, Dr. Yvette Dubell, should be disregarded. There are 1,916 tweets that I encourage you to look through so you can see exactly what we brought into the district to assist us. We will be told that this is in the best interest of our children. We will be told it's not about apportioning resources based on intersectionalities. We will also be told that there is no adopted definition of equity. It's strange that we would spend $50,000 in free federal money um, with so little known about what we are about to embark on. We will be told about many things before it is ultimately embedded into our strategic plan in the next two years. 28% of DG58 students, according to the 2019 Illinois Science Assessment, were not proficient in science. And if I misspeak this next one, if I misinterpreted it, I apologize, please, please correct me, but 50% of DG58 students did not meet or exceed proficiency in Illinois Assessment of Readiness 2019 in Mathematics. The state, only 32% of the kids in the state, state meet or exceed the IAR for math. So where is the consultant to tell us how to get globally competitive students in math and science? The same failed educational industrial complex that cannot produce kids with acceptable math and science scores globally, who pushes Common Core at a, at a cost of 15 billion across the country with no discernible benefit to the students, and now pushes SB 818, which should be the SCK 818, which is the sexual consent for kindergartners bill that is going to be uh, discussed and potentially adopted. They have another program we all, they'd like us all to get behind, which is this DEI, DEI. Our children should not be for, for forced to participate in CRT-based studies that seek to apportion resources based on intersectionality. You should just say no and have your children's data opted out. 
Get involved. If you expect as a parent to ride the lazy liver, river in education these days, you may not like where you end up. Simply look at our universities to find out where these ideologies originated and how ultimately they corrupt their host. So wake up, parents. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Ray, Pierce Downer. Forgive the three minutes of slightly more higher load. You way, you know, help clarify the message. Uh, Stephen Ray Pierce Downer. Every parent wants their kid to be safe and to grow socially and academically. If they don't, they expect to hear about it and a plan to address it. However, I have not heard about or seen a plan to address masking drawbacks on our kids' social and academic growth. You won't get them from DPH or CDC, who told us a year ago we need to lock down schools. We suffered untold but foreseeable losses because they failed to understand the cost and we followed blindly. Conveniently, in Illinois, we didn't measure those losses. Others did. Brown found a 21% drop in child IQ. Michigan, a 24% increase in child obesity. Baylor, a 190% increase in child suicide attempts. Now, those same agencies have new policies and, again, fail to acknowledge the drawbacks. For example, mass block sound, particularly high frequencies, like from kids. One study found 12% more missed words from mass speakers. Add that confusion to a classroom with typically poor acoustics and lots of background noise. Remove lip reading and nonverbals to get the perfect storm for lost learning, especially for 15% of kids with trouble hearing or 10% with auditory attention problems. This is just one of 14 drawbacks I've summarized at tinyurl.com slash dg58masks. I'm not in public health, but I do have a PhD in indoor airflow from MIT, co-author of the National Standard on Indoor Air Quality, and serve on ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force. Masks have their role, but also protocols that are impractical at school, like forcing kids to wash hands each time they touch their masks, like all but one of you failed to do in the first hour of this very meeting. I mean, how do we expect four and five-year-olds to go all day when the board can't even go an hour without breaking the protocols? We somehow invoke you know, our own medical authority to cherry pick important ones instead of actually following the protocol. What benefits do we expect from policies we don't follow? Masks have drawbacks and need to be weighed. The World Health Organization agrees. They say no masks under six and only under 12 in specific situations. Almost every other country has more lax school masking policies, several not requiring them at all, and many for students 13 and up. We're done waiting for experts to fail us again. They don't suffer the consequences. Our kids do and already have. We formed a task force to raise awareness and propose solutions to the many drawbacks of masking in school. We'd love the district to join. Three minutes is not enough. I want to close by addressing the parents. You know, this is not about them or the governor or us. It's about our kids. Your media either tells you masks are needed to keep your kid out of the hospital or from killing grandma, or, or masks do nothing, you know, but real real submission to an overreaching government. Do you really think those corporations care about how you can work with your community to solve problems? I think they know fear sells, and they want to divide and inflame us just so they can make profit by keeping your eyeballs on their commercials. Until we come together, we'll keep silently judging one another or spitting vitriol over next door while our kids suffer, both because of our policies and because they see their biggest role models fighting like school children. Let's acknowledge that we all want our kids to be safe and to grow socially and academically and make that happen together. I have Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Last card, Francisco Madrano. Madrano, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Francisco Madrano. I have two kids in the dual language program, first and third, and I'm the BPAC president. Uh, the school district made changes to the dual language program without the BPAC review, public debate, no historical data on the prop on the program academic success without incoming registration projections, without exploring alternative options such as a two-way program or expanding the criteria for participation, or without considerations on the impact for the children in the program. The district has yet to share the proven learning methodology that is being followed in our dual language program. We opted into an established dual language program that, had an, that has an approved budget, curriculum, and learning model. We committed to the program and the district has a reasonable level of commitment to deliver a quality education to the children in the program. Throughout COVID and all the board meetings, the district reiterates its intent to retain student services, specifically equitable opportunities. 
Mr. CISO characterizes the changes to the program as minor. Eliminating incoming kindergarten students from the program is not minor. Many parents with siblings in the program were counting on the dual language program for this and upcoming years. These students are now in monolingual classrooms, which is a huge disadvantage for them as they begin their early education. Dual language students are now arriving to monolingual homeroom classes, spending all day with those teachers and only pulling out for two classes a day. That is not a small change. Furthermore, I challenge anyone to switch from learning math and science and Spanish to English one day to the next and then say it's a small change. I've researched dual language education for three months and the, co and the core of its greatest benefit is to teach children that they, can, that they don't have to lose their native home language for the sake of learning English. Dual language education creates an environment of comfort and engagement that monolingual classrooms will simply never achieve. The district either chooses to ignore the most significant benefit of dual language education or does not know it. In either case, it goes to demonstrate that deciding the future of a dual language program goes beyond allocating academic hours and is too complex for any of the current school administrators to understand and to plan for the future. I recommend uh, obtaining an expert consultation with a tenured and experienced dual language consultant. I have been extremely vocal about the impact of this change on the students since June with the school board. I did not see any public session from the school board questioning the changes during June, July, or August school board meetings. Whether intentional or unintentional, this decision relegated dual language students and their families to the margins, negatively and disproportionately impacting communities that have been historically dismissed. <coughs> students and parents do not participate who do not participate in the dual language program are immune to the effects of this decision, bolstering the preferred status in our community. Our DG58 school board and the dual language student school board should be here to protect their rights to participate in a budgeted, approved, and existing school program. Per the school board policy, changes to these programs are to be made within the established processes, which has not been the case in the dual language program. I ask that the school board reinstate the dual language program as it was designed and intended as it was last year to help the dual language students meet their maximum potential and to plan for a two-way program to incorporate two language uh, two-way learning and non-english non-spanish speakers thank you thank, thank you. you thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right that was our last card so that brings us on to some action items tonight. The first one is our approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from August 9th, 2021, regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, we please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the August 9th, 2021 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the August 18th, 2021 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Abstain. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the August 18th, 2021 special meeting as presented. We now have our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. So, all right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet materials. And in that consent agenda, we actually do have uh, a new hire for a preschool coordinator. So, Kevin, if you want to. So, the board just approved the appointment of Susan Dillon to the District 58 Grove Preschool Coordinator position. I was very pleased to recommend Susan Dillon to serve as preschool coordinator. 
Throughout a rigorous interview process, Ms. Dillon excelled. The interview teams described Ms. Dillon as passionate and knowledgeable about early learners. They were particularly impressed with the breadth and depth of her educational experiences within the field. Ms. Dillon previously served as the Special Education slash Early Childhood Case Manager for Woodridge School District 68. In this role, she supervised the Early Childhood Program and oversaw self-contained and resource special education programming. Previously, she was a Special Education Coordinator for the Kendall County Special Education Cooperative, a resource teacher for Elmwood Park School District 401, and the director of St. John's Preschool in Naperville. Ms. Dillon earned a master's degree in school leadership and administration from Benedictine University, a master's degree in early childhood development from Boston College, and a bachelor's degree in special education from Providence College. I'm very excited to welcome Ms. Dillon to the Grove Preschool, and welcome, and if you would like to come up and say a few words, we'd be glad to have you. Congratulations. I just want to say very briefly, due to the hour, I'm <laughs> so excited to be here. Um, I, I feel like this is a culmination of all those things you just talked about. Um, I've heard great things about Downers Grove 58, wonderful things about the preschool, and I'm very excited to take it to the next level, hopefully. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Our first recommendation for action is the 2021-22 budget. Is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Olczyk. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget as presented. Next up is the agreement on key terms for a Village of Downers Grove and District 58 Facilities Partnership. Is there a motion to approve the agreement on the key terms for the Village of Downers Grove and District 58 Facilities Partnership? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to approve the agreement on key terms for the Village of Downers Grove and District 58 Facilities Partnership. Next up, is there a motion to approve the fundraising plan for the Pierce Downer community for improving the playground area at their school? So moved. So moved. Second. Ooh. All right. Ooh. Um, Ooh. <laughs> I, I have Melissa on that one. <laughs> we review the tape? All right. Um, let, let Emily have it. Uh, <laughs> Bardo, I don't know if you have uh, any statements that you want to make on, on the way that we structure this. I know this is kind of a regular um, process that we've been going through. And Leland's here too. Oh. Yeah, so just real quickly, um, you know, Pierce Downer Playground obviously is pretty old and uh, rusted and, and needs out, uh, has outdated equipment. The district has invested some improvements over the years in uh, newer swings, the elimination of pea gravel, but there's still substantial work left to do. And so uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Principal Wagner for I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. I also wanna recognize, um, we have Beth Riley here, one of our parents at Pierce Center who um, joined us to, to show our support, which I appreciate it, thank you. Board, thank you for your time. It's, it's kind of funny to see us back in person recognizing someone, I remember when I was on Zoom, not that long ago, <laughs> going through the same process. So. Yeah, our overall goal really is just to fundraise to, to bring a new playground to the Pierce Downer community, find something that is friendly, functional, um, inviting for, for not just our students, but the entire community. Um, some of the things we've already done with the help of Kevin and the Buildings and Grounds Department is engage the district ar architects to put some plans together and give us a little bit of a cost analysis and really what we're up against, um, given what we currently have and what we would be looking to do. Uh, we estimated it would probably be about $450,000 with the goal of raising those um, funds in about one to two years. So that'd be through a combination of different fundraising efforts, possible donations, um, as well as uh, grant opportunities that might be available. So we, we're hopeful to, to get your support and begin that journey um, as quick as possible. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys for being patient. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for coming. All right, any discussion for the board? All right, let's please call roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. 
Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve a fundraising plan for the Pierce Downer community for improving the playground area at their school. We have a 2021 through 2022 uh, serious safety hazard designation. Is there a motion to designate the areas in the attached memo as serious safety hazards for the 21-22 school year? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, I don't see anything that looks different from previous year, right? Nope. These are um, identical. Perfect. There is one addition from the last year that I don't Are you talking approved. about the... the, the Fairview O'Neill yes. yeah no so when I said they were the same that was an addition that we had discussed last year right. so yeah, it, we, yeah we implemented yeah we discussed it later on in the year perfect okay any discussion no all right can I ask a question just mm -hmm. uh, knowing the the Highland area <laughs> I know that west of Main Street mm -hmm. we have some students crossing over what's the rules around why that is not a designation but north of 39th is so there's a there's a short answer and a long answer. There, I'll take the short. Short. It, it's a point. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, they said that very quick for me. Uh, um, it's a point system by IDOT, and because the village has dedicated a crossing guard and a um, you have a, a stoplight there basically, that is one of the reasons why that would not qualify where another area would qualify. Uh, same thing with with um, Belmont in Prairie by Puffer. We have a lot of questions about that. But basically it's a point scale and you do get two discretion points and you can use plus or minus two but even with those discretion points it does not. That is one of the most common intersections that we get requests for to to review but because the village su supplies a crossing guard with the traffic control signal that's why that wouldn't qualify where other ones would. You also have to take into consideration uh, the availability of sidewalks that plays into it as well if the student is walking down uh, a street versus on a sidewalk. So all those things factor into the point system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate the areas in the attached memo as serious safety hazards for the 21-22 school year. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the resolution appointing authorized agent for Illinois Mu Municipal Retirement Fund as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on that? Can you just describe what this means that we're doing? Yeah. So <laughs> basically, again, short answer, someone in the district office has to be the appointed um, person. Uh, the previous person has recently retired, and so we have to update that, and so therefore, uh, Carly uh, Book is the uh, person we're recommending because of her role in payroll. Any other okay. questions? All right. Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to appoint the resolution I'm sorry, to adopt the resolution appointing the authorized agent for Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund as presented. Is there a motion to designate a display case, floor machine, wooden cart, 2004 GMC Silverado truck, and a 2008 Ford F-250 truck as surplus equipment? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate a display case, a floor machine, a wooden cart, a 2004 GMC Silverado truck, and a 2008 Ford F-250 truck as surplus equipment. All right. A couple of announcements tonight, some dates to note. Wednesday, September 22nd at 3.45 p.m. will be the next legislative committee meeting, and that will take place at the ASC. Monday, September 27th at 7 p.m. will be a special boarding board meeting taking place at the ASC. Uh, Friday, October 8th at 7 a.m. will be the next Financial Advisory Committee, also taking place at the ASC. And then Monday, October 13th at 7 p.m. will be the next regular board meeting, but that will take place at O'Neill Middle School. So Wednesday, I believe. Yes, it is a Wednesday. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's which it's is why it's at O'Neill. Cool. After Columbus Day. Yeah. All right. Uh, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the, uh, the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval of the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes as mandated by Section 2.065 ILCS 
122C21. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session.